Hi everyone, it's Italian Gamer Joe, your favorite Italian streamer. Uh, this is the Italian Gamer Joe podcast, aka the Italian Gamer Joe show, and I am here tonight with three lovely people to review the the Nancy Drew Diaries, the first book in the series, Curse of the Arctic Star. This is the very first Italian Gamer Joe book review that I've done on the channel, and I am very, very excited because I have three amazing people here with me that also are fans of the Nancy Drew video games, and more recently, the Nancy Drew books as well. Um, the first person that I'm going to be introducing tonight um, is a former return returning person on the show, Guava Jagular. Guava, please say hello. <laughs> Hello. Welcome on in. Are you excited tonight to review the Nancy Drew Diaries, the very first book in the series? I am, yes. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. The second lovely person here that we have tonight is another Nancy Drew streamer, Nancy Drew fan. Um, it's Mitra. Mitra, please say hello to our lovely audience. Hello, lovely <laughs> audience. Um, are you also excited to review Nancy Drew Diaries, Curse of the Dark Star? I am super excited. <laughs> have you ever done a review show before, or have you ever done like a podcast or anything? Never. Okay, awesome. So we're so really this excited is the to have experience. you. <laughs> the true, the true experience. We we're so excited too. And finally, yes. last but not least, we have another amazing Nancy Drew community member, Nancy Drew fan of the games, the books, everything that is Nancy Drew. We have the Candy Girl. Welcome on in, the Candy Girl. Hello. How excited are you to be here to review Nancy Drew? I'm quite excited. <laughs> have you also, uh, same question, have you ever been on a review show before, ever reviewed anything? No. Okay, awesome. So I am so excited to get the chance to review uh, this book with all of you. Um, I think it's going to be a really fun time. Uh, it's a really interesting mystery, and I just can't wait to get started with this. Um, so for those of you that are just listening, the Italian Gamer Joe podcast and channel, uh, we break down our reviews into sections. Since this is a book and not a game, we are changing it up a bit. Uh, we are breaking it down into three sections. So we have the storyline or the plot section, the characters section, and then finally the ending section. Each section will also have uh, commercial breaks in between, and um, each section will basically contain our thoughts. We've I've pre-prepared questions for tonight for uh, myself and our lovely uh, guests here, and I am really excited to share those questions with all of you. Uh, to keep things to keep things streaming streamlining and just really exciting. Guava, remember when we did the review with Tina and we had the three hour labyrinth of lies review? <laughs> I, I do remember. Yes, I that was a really long one. So I'm hoping this time around we uh, we can have some fun with it. And if we get to three hours, we get to three hours. But we'll see. We'll see. I I, I hope I don't think it'll be three hours, but we'll 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 see. <laughs> it was a lot too. I mean, it was a lot of like mythology. And a lot to just talk about. Um, but all right, why don't we get started? Um, the very first section for the book that we are going to be talking about is the plot. Um, and just to reiterate again, we are talking about Nancy Drew Diaries, Curse of the Arctic Star. Um, this is, and any, I, any of you correct me if I'm wrong, but this is like the Nancy Drew revival um, in the form of like modern day books. Um, Nancy is... Uh, she's an adult in these books, right? I mean, she's college age, correct? 19, I think. Okay, yeah. And um, in these books, she... I think what's interesting here is that we get to see this older version of Nancy and the authors can um, spend more time uh, focusing on these adult mysteries. Uh, they're more mature books in a lot of ways. And um, I think it's... Uh, interesting that they took that direction with Nancy. So if you're interested in picking up the book, uh, it's called The Nancy Drew Diaries, Curse of the Arctic Star. Just a quick disclaimer, though, before we get started, this is a spoiler review. I'm going to repeat that again. This is a spoiler review. The Nancy Drew mysteries have culprits in them and lots of thrills and uh, plot twists and spoilers. So if you want to pick up the book first and read it for yourself, we highly recommend you do that first before you finish this episode. Um, that way you can give yourself the opportunity to read the book first before finding out who the culprit is. 
all of us have read the book already. We know all the plot twists and the spoilers. So please, um, viewer discretion is advised when it comes to spoilers. So consider uh, purchasing the book before you listen to tonight's show. So the first section of the show that we are going to be talking about is the plot. The plot basically covers the overall story of um, of Curse of the Arctic Star. And uh, why don't we get started? So basically, the story uh, stars Nancy. <clears throat> her and her best friends, Bess and George, are taking an Alaskan cruise, um, claiming that they've won an all-expense-paid vacation. But it turns out that it's not everything is as it seems. It turns out Nancy was hired by a former friend and someone client, Becca, who is bringing Nancy on board to figure out why mysterious accidents are happening. So Nancy is going undercover with Bess and George as tourists aboard this state-of-the-art brand new cruise liner, and she has to figure out who could be causing these mysterious accidents. Guava, I'll start with you. Um, how do you feel so far? How do you feel about the overall plot of the story? Um, what were some things that you liked about it? Did you like that the mystery took place on a cruise ship? Like, how do you feel about it? Yeah, so I liked overall the frantic nature of the investigation because Nancy is there on the cruise with Bess and George, but also with Bess's boyfriend, Alan, who is not in on the secret. So a lot of the tension in the story comes from nancy kind of like running around trying to find a space to be alone on like a big cruise ship full of people and trying to like find the time to put some more thought into like the mystery so i i like that kind of uh aspect of the of the story uh i think the cruise is fun but just as like the start of like a, a new Nancy Drew series. It's a little bit generic. Uh, there's a lot of interesting set pieces, especially like my favorite is the golf course that's like based off Alaska. But like, I guess when you hear the title of like Curse of the Arctic Star, it doesn't actually uh, tell you anything about the cruise. It's just mainly just like a, you know, a sunny kind of like cruise ship with celebrities that we never actually meet it's it's like there's interesting stuff there but the story the mystery how the mystery progresses is more interesting than i think the backdrop of the cruise uh absolutely um mira how do you feel do you agree with guava on his points or what were your uh overall um uh opinions uh, for the most part i do agree the one thing that i absolutely loved that they what they did in the book was that um is that nancy has to be careful about when she's talking about the investigation like she can't be around people when she's talking about the investigation she can't be around alan when they talk about the investigation because i've seen in like these old like other mystery books that these detectives would just openly talk about the the investigation out in public and they're like how does the criminal know what i'm doing and i'm like well you talk about it out in the public <laughs> anyone can hear you yeah and that's so, then, so true that was my absolute favorite thing is that she was actually like you know her like some people finding out or like you know like some people like in the book like finding out that or someone i think the culprit was knew that she was a detective i think at some point if i remember correctly with the bag and everything um and she's like how did they know like did they accidentally overhear me so she was actually very cautious about that um and then um i like the red herrings all over in the plot mm -hmm. there were so many red herrings it was great oh absolutely <laughs> uh i agree with you i feel like the book gives you the i feel like the book dangles carrots in front of you and just when you think you know the carrot gets you know thrown out of your face and you're like oh darn it but yeah no yeah they do throw a lot of hints and clues at you um candy girl what do you think uh what's your overall opinion of the plot um throughout the time you read it so i really enjoyed the premise of the story the setting on the cruise ship um, that initial storyline of there being this mystery going on, that there's these unsolved things happening, and Becca can't explain it, and she just wants Nancy to come and figure it out. What I don't like 
and we'll probably address this more later, but I did not like the double plot line where only half mm -hmm. of the mystery gets resolved by the end of the book. Yeah, that is a very, um, a very, very big plot point. And um, for those of you that are listening, um, we have decided that we are not going to talk about the second book, Strangers on a Train, but we will spoil the fact that um, this is um, a long stretch of mystery and um, the mystery gets resolved in the course of two books. So um, in the first book, Curse of the Arctic Star, um, you get kind of like half a mystery. And then in the second book, Strangers on a Train, you get like the conclusion of the same mystery. Um, so that's Kenny Girl, what you're referring to, correct? Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Guava, you brought up a really interesting point, by the way, about the frantic nature of the plot of the story. Um, did you overall like the frantic nature of the plot? Did you find that um, fun to read through? Were you yourself getting anxiety from the frantic nature of how much the story jumps around a lot? Like, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that frantic like, um, pacing? Uh, yeah, I, I just like how it kept Nancy on her toes throughout the story. Like, she's not able to be like the best detective she can be just because she's surrounded by people that she doesn't want to like blow her cover with. So she has to play things a bit safe a lot of the times. Uh, I will say, with the double plot line... I like that it adds a kind of extra mystery to things. Like, it adds to the red herrings because things that don't get resolved, you only find that out, like, in the in the next book. Like, so there's a lot of, like, confusing things there, but it is also a bit annoying to, <laughs> to get to the end of the book. <laughs> you're like, okay, so there's extra stuff. Apparently, the two books came out at the same time, so I guess it was, like, a... Oh. Yeah, to like buy both, but it's 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 a weird way to start, because I think you once mentioned that uh, they wanted to keep the books a very specific length. But yes. With this first, yeah, but with this first entry, it was too big to keep in that small length. So they just like, okay, two books then, <laughs> which is an interesting choice. But yeah, so I'm gonna be the first to say that I am not these these were these are my first Nancy Drew books. So, Candy Girl and Mitra, if you have more um, sh to share on this, um, I was reading that th there's a certain, like, brevity to the Nancy Drew books. They kind of want to keep, um, they kind of want to keep their mysteries shorter, and that's why a lot of their books are not, like, four, five hundred, six hundred page novels. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, do any of you, do either of you have any knowledge or anything uh, to share on that aspect of it, or, um... I, I, I've noticed in the past as well, like even with earlier books, like they try to keep the number of chapters down to like 14, 15. Um, in the diaries, they only seem to be 12 chapters total each book in the series. Um, 12 to 13. So is it, oh, is it 13 too, Mira? I think it was like book three, no, book four that had like 13 chapters. Okay. But then it was like an hour long audiobook, so I was like, this is a really small book. Yeah. Yeah, F okay. Um so it's it's interesting to me that they did it this way that they did like back to back and then it, they just stretched the plot over two books. Um I I wonder I, I I do find myself asking myself that same question though. Like why did they make it two books? Why not make it just one really long Nancy Drew mystery? I have a theory. What's I your have theory? a theory why? <laughs> because they they um so this is what I think. They put in the two mysteries and like solve one mystery in one and the other in the second book because they needed something to continue people to read the book. So, like, you know, you buy book one, like, you know, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to buy book one and see if I like it. You get to the end of the book, and then there's this cliffhanger. You're like, I got to know who this other culprit is. And then you buy the second book. It's a marketing technique. Okay, okay. That's a really good thing. 100% a marketing technique. Yeah, that it that it could just be um, to get people to um, to purchase the second book to just, just to finish it off. Um, yeah, that, 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 that I can totally see that being a reason. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, I, um, 
I liked the plot of of the of the story. Um, going into my personal opinion, um, I've never been on a cruise before. I've been on. I've traveled the world. I've been on vacation. I, I've I've traveled different to many places, but never ever a cruise. So it was really cool. Uh, from the start of the book, where you have like Nancy on the gangplank, you know, checking in her luggage, to you know entering the cruise and all the little like things that go on in a cruise sh- like for example um where they all have to go to this like grandiose dinner and they have to dress nicely and george is complaining or, or was yeah george is complaining because she didn't bring anything nice to dress so she has to borrow clothes from Beth. or like how um there's just so many different places to relax on a cruise ship and so many nooks and crannies you can go explore and um, in the very first chapter, they get lost and they don't know. They don't even know where the Hollywood suite is. They're just looking around, and then they somehow enter an employee's lounge. Like the the mystery itself takes place on this ginormous ship. So it's I found it really cool um, because it's such a um, it's such a big place to host a mystery. Um, but at the same time, the authors did a really good job at like hyper focusing on certain. Uh, on certain aspects to keep it like to keep it um what's what am i looking for to to keep the mystery flowing because a cruise ship is a huge place um i also thought it was really wild that one of the first accidents that happened on board was the um the bloody body um mannequin yeah yeah and in the first chapter they end it with like, oh, come to the pool. Someone's been killed or drowned or something. And I remember Body reading... in the pool. Yeah, and I remember reading that passage and I'm like, murder in a Nancy Drew book? What? <laughs> I'm like, I is this Secrets Can Kill? <laughs> um, but yeah, so what were your reactions? Yeah, can we can we talk about that? So Guava, Meet Rock, Candy Girl, what, are your, what were your reactions after reading that first chapter? I from the <laughs> because like this is nasty true it's straight up someone's murdered and i'm like oh my god someone <laughs> murdered on a boat and then it's like it's a mannequin i'm like oh okay and then i'm like back yeah this is a kid's book <laughs> guava what about I you got, got oh really sorry excited. kenny girl go ahead sorry no go go ahead i got really excited about it i was like yes we <laughs> finally get some like good content and then I was very disappointed that it was a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> I was, that was shocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, I said before that the cruise as a whole, it's a very classic kind of mystery thing. And I think a lot of the unique aspects of that premise is more dealt with in the next book. But they do all everything you need to do with like the cruise ship. Like you have... Like the body in like the the pool and the this the wild animal and the food like they they nail all of that stuff pretty well and with the mannequin yeah it, it's just it's a very fun way to like start off a book especially like with a new series of like oh no is everything all different from before and it's like no not really but it was still kind of fun to like to kind of live with that shock for a little bit the the mannequin in the pool when that happened i straight up thought that this was going to be like one of those mystery cruises like um i think it was in uh there's a scooby-doo episode on it where they all end up on a mystery cruise Mm. for fred's birthday and they find out like super early on because everyone's getting upset that they're solving all the mysteries oh yeah (laughs) so i I straight up thought like this is like a mystery cruise and becca is just treating nancy to (laughs) A mystery cruise <laughs> <laughs> but i'm like no way that can't be right because then all the other passengers would have to be in on this joke that would, that be, a, would be like be wild. impossible yeah but it would be so funny if it was oh absolutely like imagine can you imagine that like nancy glosses over the fact that it was that's a mis- like imagine like at the end of the book nancy's like wait this is a mystery cruise and like like everyone knows except Nancy or something like they were just all in on it. Like even Bess and George. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It, like all of those, like the, the other mystery, like the loose plot threads, it's like, Oh, but what about all these things? They're like, Nancy, no, that that was part of the cruise. Do you, did you forget? <laughs> we all got notes in our luggage. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. 
Um, yeah, and also cool. like I'm so used to like the video games. Like I just associate the video games as just how the books were. So then the just the the bloody uh body in the pool. I'm just all like, that would never happen in a game. <laughs> you straight up be like, <laughs> oh my god. Maybe in the dossiers, maybe. Maybe in the dossiers, but like yeah. Um. But yeah, I, I honestly thought that it was a, fa- a fantastic uh, plot twist in that first chapter. And um, I, I don't know about you all, but I definitely, um, I in my head while reading that, that specific part of the book, I, I have like um, the Nancy Drew video games come to mind as well. Like uh, where it's like, all right, well, here we go. Time to start the mystery. And I don't know. It just, it felt like a really good jumping point for the mystery to start. I think that it, I think, I think what makes the Nancy Drew diaries. So like this specific book, um, very interesting is that every chapter, it seems like ends in some kind of like cliffhanger or some kind of like either really bad or really good thing happening. Um, Candy Girl, how do you, how do you feel about that? Like, did you notice that by any chance that every chapter seems to end like that, where it's like some crazy plot twist seems to happen or some crazy? Like, do you like the way that's paced, or do you think like is that? I, I don't even know if that's how Nancy Drew books are typically. Um, but yeah, how do you feel about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've read a lot of the older, um, the classic Nancy Drew books, and a lot of them tend to do the same thing, where they try to keep you like going chapter after chapter. Like you don't really want to stop because you're always ending on something exciting. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, so now we're each chapter. I'm gonna. So now, now that we talked about like some of the things we liked, I'm curious to know some of the things you you uh, that some of you did not like. So um, was was there anything specific about the story that um, some of you maybe just didn't like, or maybe was there certain characters or certain things that about the book that could have been handled better? Um, I, I'm gonna start. I'm I'm gonna start by saying that I think the suspect list was huge. Like we have a huge suspect list. I mean, I wrote a, um, a full like Google Doc of like all the suspects and <laughs> Mr. Drew. I mean it just it's just it's just on and on and on and I remember while I was listening to the book cuz me and I also like we did the audiobooks um it's it's a long suspect list and keeping up with who's who and what their names are and what they are doing and their motives and everything it's it's I mean we're talking like 3 to 4 suspects in the Nancy Drew games to 20 plus suspects in the curse of the arctic star so um that was one thing i did not really like and it was definitely really difficult to keep up with it reminded me a lot of a hercule perot agatha christie book um Mm -hmm. those those suspect lists can get huge but um that was something that i particularly found um inconvenient and um i um but given the environment I i guess i could also understand why they went that route but um Mira, I hear you a lot. Uh, what about you? What do you think? Do you um, do you agree, or do you have any? Is there anything in the book that you didn't like in particular? I did not like how the honeymooners were basically non-existent for majority of the story. <laughs> I mean, they're supposed to be. Wait, am I supposed to say? It's a spoiler oh, review. Name? Yeah, you can say okay. it. Okay. Yeah. That you know, I know they're they're supposed to be the culprits. But, like, they were basically non-existent. Maybe one or two scenes with them where Nancy talked to them. But other than that, it was... We got mostly interactions with Tobias, Hero, <laughs> and then, like, Wendy. And I'm like, the honeymooners were just basically sidelined, even though they were the actual culprits. I'm like, where'd mm. they go? I straight up forgot they existed up until, I think, Iris, or no, Vince, or whatever their names was. Lacey um, and Vince. They- I think, okay, Lacey, Lacey, she starts talking to Lacey and how Lacey's all like, oh, it's just a dream and I feel like I'm, something bad's going to happen. I straight up forgot she existed. Yeah. I had her in my notes. I had her in my notes. Honeymooners sus. That's <laughs> straight, when I was listening, because I'm at work when I'm doing this, so then I'm writing notes as I'm working and listening to the audiobook, and I just literally wrote down honeymooners sus. And then that's all I wrote about them. And then up until I we talked to Lacey again, and I'm like, wait interesting <laughs> yeah and um another thing to add to what you just said um there's a one there is a big carrot the writers throw at you uh and i don't remember what chapter it takes place in but there's a specific scene where we meet the abcs which is another character 
group of characters and it's during I, it's four. during the dinner i think and i think what what makes that scene so interesting is that the abc's think that Lacey looks familiar and that she looks like a singer from the Jubilee Cruises and Lacey's like oh I wish I looked that beautiful or I wish I looked that great um and it's one of those that when I read that scene uh in the book I I I I glossed over it and I didn't think much of it um but and I kept continuing, you know, reading the chapters, but I then like thought about it and I went back and read that scene again or listened to that scene again. And I'm like, something's really sus. Like why? Like some, like I, I found it so interesting. Cause this, in that specific scene, Nancy in, in the book does not think about it. She doesn't have any internal monologue about it. It's such a, like, it's like a, it's like, it's like a two sentence blink and you miss it. <laughs> and it's like, hey, this person is suspicious. And I'm like, okay. Anyway, and, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It only happens for like two sentences, and it happens to be like the biggest breakthrough in the case. And Nancy mm-hmm. like does not say anything. She doesn't <laughs> think anything. They just continue the conversation. But that ends up at, and then ends up being correct that you know they're they're part of Jubilee Cruises, and um, uh, I don't think Nancy has that revelation until the very end. It's like a eureka moment. I'm pretty moment. sure that the writers straight up thought like people would be like, "Hmm, that's a little bit suspicious," but then everyone's all like, "Okay," and then they just kept on going. <laughs> um, yeah, I will say uh, the funny thing about that is when I read that, uh, my my thought process wasn't that like, "Oh, maybe she's like the, maybe she did used to work at Jubilee." Mine was. Oh, maybe she has a twin sister who also <laughs> works at the Jubilee, and they're working together, and so they're involved somehow. And then they didn't come up in the story anymore, so I just stopped thinking about it until the very end. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was all like, oh, yeah, it was her. She worked at the Jubilee. I was like, oh, that does that is a lot simpler. Yeah, that makes sense. Now that we were talking about that, um, I just remember something I actually liked about the story. It's like a little bit funny. Is how Nancy describes almost everyone in the book. Is she always described mm. them as like attractive or handsome, and then <laughs> oh and then I'm like, Nancy, are you funny or something? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I'm like Nancy, like... are you okay? You're... <laughs> like the way she described Hero specifically, I was all like, seems like Nancy has a crush. Interesting. I, yeah, it's crazy. Um, it's that's funny. So hard. Uh, Candy it's Girl. Actually, uh, oh, sorry. Go, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, oh, I was going to say. One. That's. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay, Guava. Go ahead. Go ahead, Guava. The one, one of like the big problems I had with the book was that they kept hyping up this Lumberjack contest, and then they didn't explain any of it. There was no descriptions of any of the contestants. It was absolutely pointless. I was like, all of these men that you talk about, don't talk about the lumberjacks. Fine. Anyway, go on. I mean, <laughs> I think we should write. To, I think we should write to Carolyn Keene and be like, "Tell us about the lumberjacks. Like, give us some kind of like afterwards. Need we need men. to know." It becomes a new mystery. <laughs> Twenty-four mysteries later, Curse of the Arctic Stars lumberjacks. <laughs> but but if if Nancy did that lumberjack um, competition or whatever. She would have won, hands down. You yeah. saw her. You saw her in, and uh, what was it called? Sh- uh, the Shadow Ranch. She was chopping oh, yeah. that wood like nothing. Yeah. Straight up, true. Nancy would have won. Um, the Candy Girl. What do we, What do you think about that plot twist or that little that, that two sentence thing with the ABCs mistaking Lacey for? Uh, someone on Jubilee Cruises. Did you catch that, or what were your notes? Uh, like, how do you feel about all that? So, yeah, immediately when it happened, my brain was like, oh, they're suspect, like, right away. But then in the story, they totally get distracted by the spider, and that all goes away. Like, you just, it, it, you completely forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kenny Girl, I have a follow-up question for you. Um, how do you feel about Tobias and how Nancy has this hyper fixation on that character? <laughs> what do you, what is your opinion, the Candy Girl, on that? Oh, Nancy, I was so <laughs> frustrated, so frustrated with her that she even considered this eight year old child, this little brat. I just, I wanted to like smack her in the face. 
<laughs> you could smack me too, cause I thought so too. <laughs> I thought it was like okay. To my credit, I thought it was gonna be like one of those kitty books where it's like, you know, it's not so serious, and so like Tobias being the culprit would be like some low key thing. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean. <laughs> I <laughs> think it was Tobias at some point, and I'm like, Tobias is so angry, he makes these letters. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things with the huge suspect list, is that, like, it's a really big suspect list of people, but when you go through each person, like, none of them really stood out to me that much as, like, oh, these are, like, super suspects. It's like, you'd hear their case, and then I'd be like, yeah, I guess, but... It doesn't really make that much sense, especially with Tobias. Like, I mean, but he was definitely involved, but like, there's no way like he's the one who did this. I mean, what even drives me crazy is that there's scenes where Nancy is with Bess and George, and she has limited time to talk to them. And, she, and in these scenes, she's like, "I think Tobias is pretty suspicious," and like, <laughs> and I'm like, "You think that he somehow managed to sabotage?" Like, 300 rooms, air conditioning and heating. You think he managed to cause a chandelier to fall on the floor. You think he caused... He wasn't even on the ship yet. I mean, and they're talking about the mannequin in the pool and stuff. I mean, they did cast suspicion on him with, like, saying that the blood around the body was taken from fruit punch mix from the kids area. area. And I'm just like... And being, like, co-conspirators... And also, he's good with computers. Oh, I forgot. But I'm like, no that. kid is that good with computers. <laughs> I they could just, be wrong about they that. They just cut to Tobias, like, on a computer, like, hacking the temperature <laughs> oh, control. Man. Um, But yeah. Um, So, Candy Girl, um, we talked about Tobias. Um, Was there anything in particular, though, that you also did not like about the story or things you could have you thought could have been done better? Um, I was just really, really frustrated that Nancy had to constantly deal with Alan. Oh, yeah. And she was not able to sleuth for, like, all except for, like, the last, like, two chapters. I 100% agree. I hate it. So for, those of, like, just someone, it's okay, so for those of you, so for those of you listeners that have probably have no idea who Alan is, unless you do know um if you read this if you read the book um alan is bess's boyfriend and according to the timeline of the book um he was at a coffee shop and with nancy and then nancy and bess were there i believe he was just staring just staring at bess and Uh. nancy in the story nancy in the story mentioned something like oh that happens pretty frequently where you know men just stare at bess and they say oh, no. and they <laughs> and then they explain that Alan walks up to Bess and um like asks her out and Nancy's just like, Oh, it's a regular thing, you know, it just it happens. And then I guess like um Bess is very attracted to him because he comes across as a nerd. Is okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's a geology geog- geograph geography student, geology student. Um, geography. Geography, okay. He was, he's on eco science. Yeah, yeah. like eco. Yeah. And like all of it. he is he so he goes to the same university as uh, Nancy, Bess, and George. Um, Bess really likes him. Nancy is kind of like like on the fence about it, and then George just dislikes him. She I am George. does not. <laughs> uh, she just avoids him and just does not want to give him the time of day. But um, so yeah, to um, to just go back to what Candy Girl was saying, uh, that's who Alan is. And, um, Kenny Girl, can you elaborate more on, like, why you, um, maybe give examples if you want to, um, why, why do you have that dislike for Alan? Oh, it just seemed like every time that Nancy was trying to talk to, um, her friends about the case and try to, you know, figure out some of the clues, she was constantly getting... Alan, like, oh, let's go do this. Let's go do that. Why are you over here? Let's go sightseeing. Um, and it was just constantly pulling her away from the case. Absolutely. Um, Mira, Guava, um, what are your thoughts on Alan and how often he appears in the story and, like, 
just um, how it really halts the progression. Like, what are your thoughts on all that? I hate him. (laughs) In the beginning, like, Alan, like, his shenanigans were, like, pretty, like, cute. It's like, oh, you know, like, it's a, it's a, it's a fun distraction. Because, like I said before, I do, like, how it, like, pulls her away from the mystery and she has to, like, be more careful. And Alan is, like, the biggest part of that, of just, like, even though technically it shouldn't oh yeah and then like the and the reason why they can't tell alan is because he would just be such a bad so bad at keeping the secret and it's very clear that he would be he's <laughs> always talking to everyone like loudly like towering over them just being all like yeah look look, look at that thing over there it's, it would have been like a mess so i do like that part of the of, of it and definitely like as time went on like alan just becomes like just get, sit over there. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us alone for like a second. And I love the ways, the excuses they come up with to try to get Alan out of the room. Like, oh, Alan, I think Tobias is lonely. Can you go hang out with Tobias? Like, yeah, go entertain this child. <laughs> I will say it is very funny how they like, they'll pat themselves on the back of like, nice job. Alan doing the suspected thing. It's just like, I, feel, I don't know. Like, you'd have to be pretty dumb to not suspect this. But <laughs> he whatever. is. <laughs> He's an idiot. Yeah, I mean, and like, it's like every single scene in the in every single chapter too. I'm like scrolling through my notes, like literally every chapter they have to come up with something for Al. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> like it's like oh, Bess is Bess wants this. Alan goes and gets it, or you know, they like like every single time, and um, it's it's kind of it's almost to the point that it's like redundant, um that they have to do that so often. Like, every single time Alan's name comes up or Nancy gets frustrated because she can't talk about the case with Alan, like, ugh, I've never wanted to, like, um, I've never wanted to punch a character in a story more than Alan because of, like, it's like, <laughs> Alan, just just leave. <laughs> um, I wanted to strangle him. He was so annoying. I hated him so much. Like, okay, in the beginning, it was fine. Maybe he lost his passport every so often. And then they kept on expanding on his character. And I hated him more and more. And at the very <laughs> end, I'm like, please, stop. Just disappear. You make it so bad. <laughs> and I think I it's th- even I more... I think oh, that was the idea that they wanted him to be, like, you know, comedic relief. But then it just was done so poorly. And not only, I mean, and that, and, like, they also make him, like, very, very creepy. Um, Nancy will want to go, like, investigate, and Alan will be like, where's Nancy going? Why is she not staying with us? (laughs) And it's like, back off, dude. Like, she has to go to the bathroom. (laughs) Or, like... I do think... (laughs) Go ahead, go ahead. He's, like, (laughs) peeing all by yourself? Hmm? (laughs) Yeah, don't you know Nancy has IBS? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like uh, Alan's nice definitely callback. the. Yeah. <laughs> Alan's definitely the easiest person to be, like, the easiest suspect to take. And maybe that's also what they wanted yeah, to he do. Was my because, number one suspect. Yeah, because every, the like, all the time. suspects are there, but Alan's just always there. And so I think at the very end, when, like, she. When she fall, she falls into like the river, right? And then like he oh, that's the second picks book. her up. But is that the second book? Wait, which one? Which scene are you talking about? Are you talking about in catch catch? I keep I keep saying catch up. In, yeah, is that the are you talking book? about the scene in catch a catch a can catch a can? Where are you talking about yeah. that? Yeah, the one where uh, Nancy falls in the river. Is that oh, the one? When she gets pushed into the river, I was okay. Laughing sorry, Guava, continue, Guava. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Guava. What were you saying again? Yeah, no. yeah because. He like he like picks her up out of the water, and then after that, that's when they like figure out who who's doing all the crimes and stuff, right? But yeah, no. basically like no, no. no. So what happens is uh, they're in Ketchikan. They the cruise takes a stop in Ketchikan, and yes. Nancy uh, is decided. Nancy decides that she wants to stand the boardwalk and just kind of like be in her thoughts. Shriek. What? No, yeah, yeah. An hour later, my teeth finally saw. Yeah, so. In chapter ten is when she falls into the water. Yes. In chapter eleven, uh, and Alan saves Alan her like life. Her out. Yeah. yeah, Alan saves her life. Yeah. So my point basically is just like he's being like so suspicious, and then chapter ten, 
is when they kind of remove the suspicion off and be like, okay, he's just like some dude. And then this is what the actual stuff is. Like, and then this is what the actual like culprit is aside from all the leftover stuff that will be in the next book. <laughs> but yeah. So I, I, that's why I think that he was meant to be like the main suspect until they finally was like, no, but actually yeah. he's just some dude who can swim. And like, I agree with Mitra. I saw Alan as the comedic relief. I, because like in my head while I was reading the story, I kept thinking to myself, the the timeline doesn't make sense. Alan did not know Nancy, Bess, and George. Uh, Alan may have known that Nancy was a detective, but I mean, like he meets, um, he meets them, and then uh, shortly after he meets them, uh, they Nancy gets that client to go on the cruise. So like. I mean, my logic to that was he if he were to be the culprit sabotaging the cruise line um he would have to have known about the cruise before nancy even got the client to begin with and that was well, my he logic to know nancy's connection to the cruise too because was that again like go to nancy you would have to know nancy's connection to the cruise but yeah you have to like, know you have to know becca to nancy, somehow like, yeah exactly yeah and there could so, i mean there could yeah. have been and yeah that, that you're right there, there could have been some kind of like plot twist where he could have known some of the characters but they never they didn't really give us that information so i just yeah, assumed yeah exactly i just assumed that alan there was no way alan could have known about the cruise ship um yeah or the fact that they won this all expense paid trip um, so, yeah, Alan was like the most obvious one, but then logically speaking, it wouldn't work. Yeah, for him like to the sabotage most things. Red herring, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any interesting plot points that they did not like about the story? Um, I don't like how um, basically the entire Clue Crew demonized Wendy. Like, she was, like, super cool and oh, everything. Wendy and, yeah. yeah, Wendy Webster. And then they're like, wow, she's such a loser. And I'm like, dang, <laughs> you, you're just <laughs> trashing her and she's being super nice. Yeah. Uh, like, along, aside from Tobias. Humanized her. Yeah. Candy Girl, what do you feel about that? Do you agree with Mitra? Yeah, I thought Wendy was really cool. Um, she was the coolest one of all of them. Yeah, and, like... Nancy claims that she has a travel blog and that she could be committing accidents to help bring um, more attention to her travel blog. I I think it's an, I think it's a good motive, but at the same time, it's to me like I saw Wendy as like an influencer. I didn't see her as like a culprit. I didn't I, the motive just didn't fit with me at all. Um, uh, not that an influencer like that could potentially be a culprit, but it, Wendy just seemed like she was. Um, that she was just too innocent, uh, and they were trying to. I feel like they were giving her the Tobias treatment, where they were like hyper focusing on Wendy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. If they didn't mention that, like her travel blog could be a motive, then maybe I could have seen her more as a suspect. But they said it pretty plainly, and so it was like, well, it's obviously not going to be that because you're already like suspecting it. So, yeah. So um, Wendy's like so much cooler than them, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's one point in the book that I want to bring up that I actually okay. So to transition away from bet from things we didn't like, um, I'm gonna transition to um, just key fun fun moments in the story in the plot that I did like. So in the beginning of the book, Nancy sees the luggage person clip her luggage with her name and room number on it, and they make a big deal about like the HS that the guy writes. And then when Nancy gets to her room, her luggage goes missing and she's like freaking out. And um, if any of you in the audience or uh, like play the Nancy Drew games, especially the early ones, I thought everyone in the Nancy Drew community always jokes that Nancy brings like her mom jeans with her on every case. Like here's Nancy packing all these mom jeans. So when Nancy loses her luggage, I couldn't help but laugh at that scene. Cause I'm like, I'm just imagining Nancy on her le on her knees being like, why my mom jeans? <laughs> she always carries a spare though in her, in her purse. 
<laughs> like, yeah. what am I gonna do with all these mom jeans? <laughs> Emergency mom Who's jeans. Who's just matching mom <laughs> jeans and that green horse shirt? All <laughs> she didn't change it to anything else. <laughs> imagine the imagine the person like imagine they find Nancy's luggage and someone like destroys the, the horse shirt. <laughs> Like, no, like in no no like uh she'd be like the her her luggage comes she sees it destroyed and she'd just be like no <laughs> on her knees hands in the air someone just puts a mad face on now. it <laughs> <laughs> this is where we're blending in games with the books <laughs> i know right imagine the horse shirt like gets replaced with a picture of dave it's just a dave shirt um <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i thought that scene just for whatever reason when i read that scene it, i was like crying laughing because i'm like oh no nancy's mom jeans what is she gonna do <laughs> um um but yeah were there any moments in the story that any of you thought were like really funny or silly or any moments in the story uh that live rent free in your heads i had a close call of like in the story of when they were talking about like the maids and then because uh with tobias and the spider like the whole clinching thing of like tobias obviously didn't use a spider like he seems pretty truthful so whoever t took the spider had to have access to the room and so they mentioned the maid and they also mentioned that like oh yeah the maid she's like a nice filipino lady and i was like Okay, I know I said that was probably the maid, but if it ends up being her, I'll be so mad. <laughs> but luckily, luckily they flipped it around because there were two maids, and that that was actually just a, another red herring of like, no, there was another maid who was actually like the false maid. It was, was the, one the who butler. Sold the yeah, exactly. It's like okay, good. Our <laughs> my my our honor is uh, protected because Filipino maids and like being like thieves and stuff is a very common racist. The brown kind person's the culprit. This book is racist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Closing it. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> like, Good type of, type you of letter to Carolyn Keene. No. How dare you? <laughs> um, that is a very yeah. And going going into that concept of red herrings, um, I actually do want to talk about something we uh, kind of glossed over a little bit, which is the accidents themselves. Um, the only accidents can we can we just like recap the accidents in the book real quick? So there was the mannequin in the pool. There was the spider in the bread rolls, the chandelier yeah. that fell. Oh, the and then the, the moose antler. The fall. moose antler that the almost kills Nancy. Nancy's luggage getting stolen. Nancy's and then luggage. Returned with the letter. Oh, and then the um the person that did wait did it happen in this book where someone did Nancy's laundry, <laughs> or was that the that next was book? No. Okay, the second book. Sorry, sorry. Okay, um, they're blending together for me. Okay, um. Were there any other There's accidents? The, it is one big story. Nancy getting pushed in the water at Ketchikan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there were the initial emails. Oh yeah, the, the emails. Oh yeah. Of the 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 system the the climate controls of the yep. cabins. So there's oh, a, there yeah. were quite the a little bit of accidents. Um, and then I think at the very last one, they were putting itching powder in the. Uh, lotion or sunscreen or something oh yeah they were yeah. i forgot about that <laughs> okay so on that note do you all think that the accidents in the book were appropriate or do you think that they could have been more intense do you think that the accidents um fit the theme of the book nicely or do you think that like some of those accidents could have been more morbid or more um uh more intense for the story what do you think guava well, I, I think. Loved. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Continue. Continue. Uh, I. Yeah. Well, I think. Yeah. Basically, like, they're very classic cruise incidents, but the moose one was obviously the favorite because it was the most unique and interesting, and like actually like almost caused harm. It was like very like shocking. So, I think the other ones like, and I do like the body in the pool. Like, yeah, there's like a good amount of like mix of shock and uh, potential harm and just like you know it's a cruise of course it's going to be like itching powder in the lotion and uh, spiders in the food that kind of thing yeah Miro about you do you think the accidents could have been worse or do you think they were fought just fine okay for me I would have liked a more intense one but what they had now is because they were trying to sabotage the 
the the cruise line not hurt anyone it was fine you know their intention was not to hurt anyone or give anyone serious harm um it's kind of like what was happening at in in white wolf of icicle creek they were trying to you know deter people away from there but not cause serious harm i mean rip to that person who broke their leg but <laughs> um, um so you but, think, so you like, think it's appropriate I, I I would have liked a more intense version, like someone, you know, breaking their leg. That would have been cool. You know, you know, <laughs> someone um, passing out in like because of, you know, they have diabetes or whatever. Or, you know, whatever thing like, you know, straight up like there was actual stakes in this thing, because from as I was going through, I was like, there's no real stakes in this thing. Like, the worst thing that could happen is the cruise line goes out of business. That's it. Not like mm. someone can seriously get hurt. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Candy Girl, what about you? Do you think that the accidents were appropriate, or do you think they could have been more intense? I think they were pretty good. The only one that I, like, really um, I thought was kind of silly was the chandelier, just because it happened when no one was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, that would have been way more effective if it was, like, as people were entering the theater or something. Yes, I it definitely felt like agree. A... And that's what I'm talking about. Some <laughs> actual potential harm could come in. It would have been yeah. so good. And like the chandelier accident, I, 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 I don't know it. And like the other thing too is in the back of the in, the in the back cover of the book, Nancy's diary mentions the chandelier falling in the dining room, and I, I think it was the dining room, and like when I was reading the chapter of the book where they're all in the dining room, I'm expecting it to happen and it doesn't happen. And I'm like, wait, what? I thought there was an accident that was supposed to happen in here. And I agree with you, Kenny girl. Like I thought it was weird that if you're going to cause some kind of ruckus or cause some kind of mayhem on the ship, why not do it when most people are in the room? Um, I mean, like meet right. Like what you're saying, like you don't, you're not trying to kill, but you're just trying to make things inconvenient. Um, I'm just surprised the chandelier didn't happen in the, in, that, in that section. I think it would have, if anything, I think it would have been more exciting um, to have like a back to back like accidents that are more getting more intense by the second. Like we have the mannequin, and then you have the chandelier falling. I actually, I think that would have, I, I, I agree. Like I think that would have fit perfectly if they would have done that because you're starting to see like the accidents get more dangerous and. The, the book starts to become a thriller, but so I'm just shocked they didn't do that. Um, what, do, what do you think, Candy Girl? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think um, it should have been getting progressively more intense. Um, some of it was sort of like out of order because like the mannequin was definitely shocking. That was, that was a big one. Um, but then there were some more minor ones in between. Absolutely. Um, I I think the accident of her falling in the icy water of Ketchikan was pretty good. I thought that was a really, really uh, Nancy Drew video game moment. <clears throat> and um, I, I'm glad I'm glad that we got some kind of like action there. Um, not that we want Nancy to be in trouble or in danger or to die or anything, but I when it comes to die. writing <laughs> when it comes to writing a story like this, it definitely adds to the intensity. Um just can you just imagine if curse of the arctic star ended with like a titanic scenario where like something just like oh, horrific happens happening. and like the ship sinks like oh my gosh like i i <laughs> can you just imagine like people coming away from that book and being like nancy nancy dear diary <laughs> i saved jack <laughs> dear diary we're drowning <laughs> I'll never let go. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy's Alan's like, dead. <laughs> Nancy's like, dear diary. It, it was a really simple puzzle to fit best George and me on the on the door. Unfortunately, yeah. Alan didn't make it. <laughs> I was like, oh, Alan, we're drowning. Can you think you can like find like a a, a door hinge or to like help us like so we can stay on? It's like, yeah, sure, I'll go get it. It's like, thank God he's gone. Anyway, <laughs> back like, to he's... drowning. Yeah, right. Like, I think we see Tobias over there by one of the other wreckage. Can you go find him? 
Yeah. Sure. Uh, hey, Alan, can sink, you yeah. save Tobias, like, be his boat? <laughs> He's like, no problem. Just back yeah. floating through the, through the <clears throat> sea. Yeah, it's... It, um. So yeah, I, I I agree. Like I think some of the accidents were very uh, appropriate, and I think that others were um, pretty intense. Um, I just kind of wish that um, that the accidents kind of would have become more and more intense as it went. It, it seemed like more like a roller coaster of of like not so intense. And like the Hollywood Suite did not get affected by the temperature change. I think it would have been really funny. If Nancy or Bess and George would have woken up in the middle of the night and been like, oh, it's freezing in here. <laughs> and then like, I don't know, like 20 minutes later, they're like, oh, it's so hot in here. <laughs> and then like 20 minutes later, they're like, oh, my God, it's freezing. Like, I think it would have been cool if they would have done something like that. But no, it was just they kind of I don't know. Like, it's like, like, why didn't it affect the Hollywood suite? I don't know. Because they're special. <laughs> like the Hollywood treatment. It has its own temperature control. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that I'm pretty sure Max controls. Probably. Mm-hmm. Probably. Is that his name? Yeah, it's Max. Next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I for like when I was imagining these characters, Max looks like Max from the Quarry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So I was imagining him like that, and then Alan. I just just imagined like this tall surfer like dude with like long blonde hair, and I'm just like, oh, I hate, hate. I could just <laughs> imagine Chris Pratt, and it would be fine. <laughs> Chris um, Pratt's trash. So before, okay, so before we uh, go into characters, um, okay. does anyone have any other plot points that they would like to bring up before we close off this section? Going once. Wendy should have appeared more. <laughs> she was so much cooler. I don't like how she, they only teamed up with her. And actually, they don't even team up with her in this book. We'll um we'll get to that in the characters, but I agree. Um, does anyone though though does anyone else have any plot points that they want to talk about before we before we go to the next section? Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention was the fact that um, Nancy had this contact, her initial contact, Becca. Um she was barely able to speak with her the entire tri- entire time and she had intended to go check out the emails and never got the opportunity to do that oh yeah yeah wow that's like a big continuity bug then or not bug sorry a big continuity error well, um, that was, yeah that was the well, they're like well like, you uh, don't need it anymore yeah and the celebrities just were were kind of like a non-factor in this book despite being like the main reason she was called onto the cruise of like, yeah, our Brock, main star is like yeah. gone. Yeah, and it's like, I don't know who yeah. Brock is. Like, who cares? The Pokemon trainer. Like, <laughs> charity a celebrity yeah. would have been great. Like, yeah. Um, like, it would have been like Dustin Beaver or something, and they're like, <laughs> Dustin Beaver, I love his music. And I'm yeah. like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Candy Girl, that is a really, really good point about the continuity there. Like, Nancy did not investigate that at all. Um, and, like, I, I feel like that would have been a great moment for Tobias to, like, look into that and kind of be like, oh, I'm good with computers. Let me trace this. Oh, look, this email was sent by someone from Jubilee or I don't know, something. But, yeah, no, they they didn't look at this. At, they didn't look at it at all. Also, George brought her laptop and stuff to the cruise did barely anything with it like she was supposed to be researching stuff why is she researching in like the the tech where is it they had like some computer yeah, it was like a area tech lounge. yeah computer yeah, lounge. tech lounge i'm like what is the point of bringing the computer if you're not going to use it <laughs> just i'm just ima- I, I don't or... I, i'm just imagining like everyone being like let's go to the tech lounge and then george is like wait what about my computer and everyone's like no the tech lounge is better <laughs> better wi-fi just just better let's go um yeah this is supposed to be a modern mystery and the fact that she wasn't online searching up every single suspect was kind of strange and yeah, they, they bring up smartphone. youtube she, and they bring they up they like in social the book networks. she has a smartphone and so she never uses it and i'm like google is free use it come on yeah i guess that's what happens when old people read about write about young people <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I tried. You know, it's funny you say that because 
I was trying. I was trying to look up the Carolyn Keene act like like authors uh, for this mystery, and Simon and Chester keep it un- like like they keep it very like under lock and key. If you want to send feedback to this Nancy Drew book or any of the mysteries, you have to paper mail Simon and Chester Are and write what? a letter to them, and then addressing Carolyn Keene, addressing the authors that is the only way that you can send feedback directly to them they will not disclose the author they will not disclose you have to send paper mail to simon and chester to talk to give them feedback for the paper authors that write mail Andrew. that is so lame it is the weirdest thing ever <laughs> i'm like really they don't have do a it. form or something like like a like a like a message you can just send to simon and chester then they can just forward it to the authors of the nancy drew diaries like what um, but yeah, I, I, uh, Let's do it. I'm going to do it. I have, I have postage stamps and everything. <laughs> <laughs> You're just, it's just going to be like a picture I'll of, gonna, a... I'll just mail them be like, what the heck? <laughs> Who's writing these books? Why is not Nancy not using her phone? It'll Why be a... is best not doing anything on her phone. Why is George not doing anything on her phone? These what well, kids will search up everything on their phone. Mira, I'm imagining you also including a t-shirt of a horse with a mad face on it. <laughs> And then I'll be like, also, Alan sucked. <laughs> um, Best deserves the absolute finest man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kenny Girl, thank you for that point. Um, was there any other comments or was there anything else uh, anyone wanted to bring up? Nope. Okay. Good. So, before we go to the character section, um, I want to do a complete like uh, summary of your rating so the rating system we do here at italian gamer joe is a zero to four stars rating um but we also base it on food so um if you give the story a four out of four star review that means it's a full course meal uh that means that it was a fantastic meal and it left you feeling full um if you rate it a one star review on the flip side, um, that is uh, an appetizer. So that would be like a primi piatti. That would be like an appetizer in Italian restaurants. That would be like, I don't know, you go to an Italian restaurant, you order like fried calamari or bruschetta. You order something like, like, like something to like, that tastes good, it's great, but you're like hungry for more. If you rate it two stars, uh, that would be like um, a... A uh, secondo piatti, which would be like a chicken dish or a meat dish or a really hearty pasta dish, something that fills you up, but um, you just there's just like it's it's great, but there's just something you're missing. Three stars out of four um, would be the like, or wait, no, that was the three stars out of four, wasn't it? Um, and then finally, four stars would just be like the full course meal. So um, uh, I will start. I rate this plot of the story three stars out of four. I think it's a really hearty Nancy Drew mystery. I love the cruise ship plot line. I think that what makes it so great too is that it's a vacation mystery. Um, I think the big character plot list of, of suspects, um, while pretty big, um, they do a good job of hyper-focusing on certain characters and... I also think that when it comes to just summarizing it all, um, I think the story does a really good job at giving you, at waving a carrot in your face and always like dangling it, but not completely uh, giving you everything all at once. And if you are a really uh, observational person, or I guess when it comes to listening or reading, um, you really could figure out who the culprit is, especially earlier on in the story. Uh, with that like two liner where it's like, oh, I thought you were, um, I thought you you look like a singer from Jubilee Cruises, and it's like, oh no. So I I, I do like how they kind of like sprinkled that huge plot point in there. Um, so I have to give the rating a three star out of four review. Um, so we'll just go down the, the the group. So Guava, what about you? What is your rating for the plot of the story from zero to four stars? So I think. The plot overall is like very strong, and I do like it, but I think just because it is technically split between two two books, like there's a lot of payoff in the next book, i probably give it a two star. Okay, and then um, do you have any other points you wanted to add to that, or just, just two stars? You're like, just two stars, that's it. Uh, 
yeah, two stars. Like the two stars are for it's like all like the like the mystery, the red herrings, like that worked really well. I think a lot of the characters didn't really have an impact until the next book. Uh, like a lot of like the red herrings and stuff. But what we got in this book was still very solid. It's just you know as a first entry it's half of the first entry and that's the main reason why okay nice um Mitra, what about you how many stars would you rate the overall plot of the story from zero to four okay so i had two different ratings for this by itself i gave it a three out of four okay but with the inclusion of the second book I gave it a two out of four. Ooh, wow. Okay. It so, went down. Yeah, same. The second book was so much better. It, there is a lot more. Um, and it has Guava said it pay off in the in the, in the second book. So the first book became super underwhelming. Okay. So that's why it went down in rating. But one thing I liked about the first book, I I liked the pacing of the books. How it's like twelve chapters, and then I can finish it in around three hours of the audiobook. Um, that I liked because, for one thing, I can fully concentrate on this book. I can read it like from front to back, fully concentrated, and I won't lose focus. I don't know, like you know, other books, it takes me days to finish them because I'll read like a bunch, and then my mind is all like, "This is too much. I need to stop," <laughs> and then I'll stop. But this one, I'm able to like breeze right through it. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, but like yeah my biggest gripe was that the fact that it was super underwhelming compared to the second book okay and also the suspect was near non-existent in within the book okay Halpert was non-existent in the book yeah absolutely um yeah thank you thank you so overall then um for this first book standalone by itself you're gonna give it are you giving it two three, three out of okay got it and then um finally uh candy girl um what is your rating of the overall plot of the story uh, of the standalone book by itself from zero to four stars? Two stars. Okay. Same reasons. <laughs> it's just uh, <laughs> it's, uh, a little bit uh, underwhelming when you get to the end and you're just left with a whole another book to read. Uh, it was pretty fast paced, though. I mean, reading it, you could read through it pretty quickly. Um, it was frustrating that Nancy hardly did any sleuthing the entire book. Um, so that's why I give it two stars. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for uh, reviewing the plot line of Nancy Drew, Curse of the Arctic Star with me. Uh, we are going to take a very quick break. And when we come back, we are going to jump in to the characters and the full suspect roster um, of Nancy Drew curse of the arctic star stay tuned for danger <laughs> stay tuned we'll be back soon uh once again we're just gonna take a really quick short break and when we come back we will talk about the characters Welcome back, everybody, to the Italian Gamer Joe Show, aka the Italian Gamer Joe Podcast. I am here today with three amazing Nancy Drew game and book fans: uh, Guava Jagular, Mitra, and the Candy Girl. Tonight, we are reviewing Nancy Drew Diaries: Curse of the Arctic Star. This is the very first book in the Nancy Drew Diaries series. And over the last hour, we have been talking about the plot of Nancy Drew, Curse of the Arctic Star. Right now, we are going to be jumping into the character portion of the show. For those of you that don't know, uh, the character portion of the show is where we talk about characters that we were suspicious about. Um, if our initial suspicions were correct, our favorite characters, our least favorite characters, and our overall opinions of the characters. So the first quest, the first like major question that I came up with for the show is, um, what were your initial suspicions and how did it change throughout the story? For me personally, I suspected two characters. Um, I suspected Scott, who was like the excursion specialist, and then I also suspected Alan. 
Um, all throughout the story, Alan was very annoying of a character to me. Um, there were just so many moments that, and we talked about this in the previous segment, but there were so many moments that he tried, the, the story made it seem like he was comic relief, but he was just very pushy. He was constantly scheduling things for Nancy to do. Um, and, and their, and her friends, they were constantly coming up with excuses to try to get rid of him. And it just didn't sit well with me. And that was one of my initial suspicions. I also suspected Scott because halfway into the story, Nancy follows Scott throughout Ketchikan and Nancy finds out that Scott, um, owes money to some shady people. Um, that he was she was following him while he was paying some debts so i found that to be very suspicious as well i um i was also suspicious of when the abc's brought up lacy being a singer uh that was something we talked about in the last segment that was something that really got my alarms blaring and um, those were pretty much my initial suspicions in the story. How did they change? Well, they kind of just stayed the same. Scott wasn't in the story that long until near the end. Alan was all throughout the story, so my suspicions were pretty much the same for him. And then as far as like the ABCs and Lacey, um, it only happened once in the beginning. And like, like, like some of you were saying, um, it just, yeah, it, it, um, my suspicions were pretty like locked on. Um, I did not, I didn't really fall for any of the Tobias or the Wendy Webster stuff. Um, it was mostly just Scott, Alan, and Lacey. Um, so those, those were my suspicions. Uh, the Candy Girl, I'll start with you this time. What were your initial suspicions and how did those suspicions change throughout the story? So my initial suspicion was Scott, just because right in that very first chapter, um, Nancy kind of gets held up by him and the exposition with him just seemed too long for him just to be another character. Um, and like you said, there was more with him later on that kind of, uh, added to that suspicion. Um, I did for a while suspect the Hawaiian shirt guy, um, which we really haven't talked about him yet. Oh. Um, he kind of has been seen behind some closed doors talking to staff um and he's just kind of like around here and there but never really staying in one spot um so he was always sort of a suspicious character to me um and of course uh, the honeymoon honeymooners right away um when the mannequin thing happens they were very dramatic about it um, and then later on, um, with, like you said, with the ABCs, uh, that conversation, uh, as well as when they're sitting by the pool and Lacey is just really, really, um, playing up the whole curse aspect. It was kind of suspicious when she started doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, those were, those are some great suspicions. Um, and I like how our suspicions are kind of similar. You did bring up the Hawaiian shirt guy. And I do find it very funny that we... I don't even think we finished the... I don't. Th I think we, it's not even to the second book that we know Hawaiian shirt guy's name. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we find out it's Hawaiian shirt man. <laughs> Ooh, it's Hawaiian shirt man. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we, we're reason, off by one word. The only reason I didn't suspect him was because I thought he was like some undercover boss kind of situation where they hey, like yes. pose as the guest and then they'll see like the employees slip up and be like you're fired oh, <laughs> some geez. nonsense like that. I yeah. thought that's what he was. So Mira, I mean, oh sorry, go up, go up. I just was suspicious of him. It's because I, I thought he was an undercover boss. <laughs> That's the only. I think I don't think he was like I, I thought he wasn't related to anything. I thought he was an undercover boss. That like, is you know, really making sure funny. that everything about uh, of the Arctic Star was like going thing. And that would explain yeah. the camera crew as well if they mm -hmm. were trying to film a show. Yeah. Yeah, that, I didn't even think about that. Mira, what <laughs> were your suspicions though, like overall? Okay, so <laughs> Candy Girl's gonna laugh at me, but <laughs> but honeymooners, Tobias and Hero. <laughs> okay. 
And how did that change throughout the story? Uh, so for me, the hero was quickly eliminated. Like when I found out that he was like, he had to be with the kids all the time. And I'm just like, yeah, nah, kids notice everything. There's no way he could have done anything like in secret. Okay. Um, and then Tobias was also taken out. I think the when the spider scene happened, when the spider ended up in the pastries with, ha- with Hazel. Yeah. Yeah, with Hazel. And so I was like, I'm like, okay, that's probably what he was stuffing in his pocket earlier. So uh, he's probably not. He's probably just some kid, and you know, it, it's just it's a huge red herring. Um, the honeymooners. Okay, yeah. As the candy girl said, they like when that pool scene happened, they'd be like, "Oh, I knew we should have done Jubilee or some nonsense like that." Like they name drop straight up Jubilee, and then later <laughs> on in the conversation, uh, she's like, "Oh, you look like just like that singer in Jubilee," and I'm like, "Huh, interesting." And then I just forgot about it until the very end. <laughs> okay. No, yeah. Exactly. Um, Candy Girl, did you have anything to say to Mitra about her suspecting Tobias? <laughs> oh, I- I'll-, I'll leave you alone on that one. Although I will say, Hero, I had a suspicion about him, but it wasn't that he was a suspect. My suspicion was that he is dating Becca. That's you why know, I thought okay. the same thing. Yeah. My suspicion it is that they're like exes because yeah. uh, she. Because they don't really like with the way that they were interacting with each other. I feel like you know they were like they used to date, but then they broke up, and they're kind of like amicable. And it's just super mm-hmm. awkward for them right now. Yeah, that that's, that's <clears throat> was my my thoughts about here as well. Yeah. Um. So Guava, what about you then? What were your initial suspicions, and then how did that change throughout the story? Yeah. So the way I approach like my suspicion like who i find suspicious is like i tried to be very like open about it so when i first first reading through it like it was basically alan and lacy are who the people who i had the strongest feelings alan obviously because he's throughout the entire story so you're always like having thoughts about what he's doing when he was very annoying Uh, and then (laughs) Lacey, I knew she must have been, like, uh, involved in some way because the way they were so uh, emotional about what was going on, like, it felt like they were, like, Nancy was talking about how, like, maybe Wendy was trying to uh, drum up some suspicions about, like, the the crew. And I was like, that's what Lacey is kind of doing. It's like being so, like, oh, I'm so sad. Like, this is such a horrible thing to happen to me. It felt very suspicious, but... I also didn't really think too much about it after that, just because, uh, as we've said before, like they disappear completely from the story until the very end again, and you don't really see them too much. So, as it changed throughout the story, like I quickly realized that Tobias was not a culprit or anything, but like so it had to be somebody who could like get into their room and steal Hazel the spider. So. I was wondering about, like, people who could do that, which I think made me suspect uh, one of the maids, and, yeah, like, it ha- I just knew it had to be, like, a uh, an employee, which is why I didn't really suspect, uh, like, Hawaiian shirt guy, because we we don't know who he's, what his deal is, and or Wendy. Those were some great... Uh, oh. Yes. Suspicions. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, not not about the sus- suspicious characters. No. Okay. So yeah, I, I I agree with you on all of those, and you brought up some very very good points. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to go into the next question, which is, was your suspicions correct? Um, so for me personally, like I was right that Scott was suspicious, but I was very off about him being the culprit. Um, I, I don't know. I don't even know what it was. Like, I remember reading about Scott in the very beginning of the book. And like, I think the only reason why I thought he was suspicious was because he was the first male character Nancy talks to or like one of the first or second people she talks to. And I'm like, he's suspicious. But like, it turns out my suspicions were correct. So I like, as far as him being suspicious, but 
totally off about him being the culprit. Um, and then I was also very wrong about Alan being suspicious and being the culprit. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I uh, like when he saved Nancy's life after she, after she got pushed into the catch can like river. Um, I, t- I took that as like his like knight in shining armor moment. And I was like, OK, OK, he's the comedic relief. I need to stop being such, you know, like so suspicious. Like it, to me, it almost felt like a moment where like the Nancy Drew authors were like, ha ha, we got you. <laughs> and I was like, darn it, like make him so suspicious. And then we end up saving him or they end up saving. She ends up he she ends up getting saved by him. Um, but I was right about Lacey and Vince being suspicious and that is something that makes me so happy. I remember when I read that scene, I which I'll go back, which I'll go into like in the ending. But um, I was very like happy about that. Um, I was not expecting Iris to be part of that whole like culprit thing. That was something that that I was not right about. Um, and yeah, those are pretty much like my suspicions and. A lot of them were wrong, and one of them was correct. Um, so that was that was pretty much me. Um, Guava, I'll start with you though. What? How about you though? Like, what, as far as your suspicions go, um, were any of them correct? Uh, yeah. Like, the thing is, my suspicions were very like soft. So like, I knew Lacey was suspicious, and uh, I knew that. But and I knew that. Um, somebody had to be have a connection to hazel which is probably my the the main suspicion that was like correct but like if you in the middle of the story if you asked me like oh who do you think is the culprit i probably wouldn't have said lacy because i would have forgotten about her i probably just been like oh i don't know it's hard to tell who it could be like i wouldn't have made the decision (laughs) but uh otherwise like it pretty much went the way i would have suspected if i had like really like took out all the evidence and like looked at everything so yeah yeah absolutely um Mira, what about you um were your suspicions correct and um what is what, what is your reflection on all these i if one of the initial suspects um that i forgot to mention was alan uh, because i just hated him and i thought he was just super suspicious like bruh why are you suspicious but you know he was he he i just hated him um the honeymooners i was correct about because you know again like you know they they made there was like really obvious clues that they were you know they were suspicious and i ended up being correct about that um with tobias and hero that one is because again I didn't take the book very seriously and the fact that you know I thought like you know straight up a kid would be the the culprit was a, was a testament to how seriously I took that book and I was so wrong about that and it was really funny <laughs> Nice okay yeah no it's it's, it's really cool hearing like your, all of your reflections and um <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, and hearing like how those reflections pan out or those suspicions pan out. Um, Candy Girl, what about you? Um, were your initial suspicions correct? And if they were not correct, um, what's your reflection on them? So just like you, I suspected Scott in that you know he there was definitely a reason to be suspicious about him, uh, but it wasn't that he was the culprit. Um, and the Hawaiian shirt guy, that was definitely wrong. Um, and I, I did suspect the honeymooners because of their dra- dramatics, because of what the ABC said in that conversation. Um, but it just, it's one of those things where it gets overplayed by the spider and then Nancy like doesn't even say anything about it in her thoughts and y- it kind of gets glossed over. So even though it was there in the back of my mind, it didn't really like hit me until it unraveled at the end. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, thank all of you for um, for telling me about your initial suspicions and if they panned out in the end. Um, it's, it's always it's always fun to like. Um, I, if there's one thing I gotta say about these Nancy Drew books, is that I underestimated them when it comes to 
uh, like this compared to the games. I I um I was I went into the books that, like like really with 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 not really any expectations, and to have my suspicions kind of have that same feeling as the games. It really does feel good um, to be wrong and to be right. And um, yeah, no, I just I really I really do enjoy it. Like um, uh, when when my notes and my all my like note taking all my suspicions like are panning out and even in the moments where they don't pan out i'm just like wow i completely missed that um so thank you for thank you for um for uh talking for for all of you for talking about your reflections um the next question i want to go into is a fun question uh favorite character so um candy girl i'll start with you who is your favorite character in the entire book and why wendy webster (laughs) the travel blogger she just seemed like a really cool fun character her job is really cool um and i really wish that there was more of her in the book yeah she she um there was a scene i think in this book where they talk about the travel blog and they read an article from her blog and i agree she's like she's a very interesting character and nancy does like she sus- just have suspicions on her a lot um but yeah i agree she was a very cool character and um i also thought it was interesting how after every single accident wendy was always on the scene and it was always like clockwork like nancy almost gets killed by a moose antler wendy's like hey everybody and i'm like wendy where did you come from <laughs> the only one we didn't see wendy in was in the ketchikan river when Nancy gets pushed in, I'm just imagining like Wendy in the river with Nancy, like, <laughs> "Hey, Nancy, this water's freezing." <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Wendy's a great character. Um, yeah, thanks, Kenny Girl, for that one. Um, Mira, what about you? Who is your favorite character in the book, and why? Do we still got you, Mira? Okay, so we're going to, um, I think Mitra is having some internet issues, so Guava, we're going to just switch over to you. Guava, who is your favorite character in the book and why? Okay, so uh, first I want to give my um, uh, my runner-up, which is basically all of the muscular men that Nancy described in the book. <laughs> uh, special mention goes to Baraz, the cameraman, uh, the, the seasick king. He was, he was very fun, and I wish <laughs> he did more other than get seasick and look kind of suspicious just running away. Aw, yeah. But, <laughs> but really, my favorite character characters were the ABCs, just because it was fun having like the old, like the old ladies who are very like well versed in all of the cruises, like hanging out and like basically giving advice to to the new kids. So. I thought I just thought they were like they had such a, like a fun energy, uh, similar to the old ladies that you see in like in the video games of just like in this story we got three of them they're just like hanging out being fun, uh, yeah and you know they're they're the ones who figured out the crime before I, we'd even like thought about it happening, so they knew about Lacey like the suspicions so yeah that's the awesome. ABC. I don't remember their specific names, but <laughs> <laughs> they were really cool characters. I really uh, loved uh, the ABCs. They, they um, I, if anything, I wish we got to see more of them or got to hang out with more of them. Um, yes, I, I even would have loved it if one of them was also a detective and like maybe they could have had like a heart to heart with Nancy. Like, ooh, I was a detective back in my day or something like that. But um it would have been cool if nancy did like have more time with them and it it felt like we got robbed of of some some genuine abc time um candy girl what about you do you like guava's uh picks um for baraz and the abcs uh yeah the abcs were definitely like my number two choice um alice babs and coral they just seemed like really interesting characters um and again i would have liked to have more of them in the book absolutely um guava i love that you picked baraz because he doesn't like hardly ever show up until near the end um 
when someone when they talk about him, they talk about um, about Baraz and how he has seasickness and he had footage of the accident and he ends up being like a pivotal character. But yeah, I mean, yeah, was he also described as being handsome? <laughs> like, Here's the thing. I think when they're first described, Jesus says there are two burly cameramen that come running up. So now that now that I've like been looking back in the book, like I don't think there's any other like real description of him other than that. But I don't know. Bar- Barat's just like a fun name. So I just really like latched onto him as like a character of like, oh, this guy's cool. That is too funny. Yeah, I yeah no fantastic character. Um, so Mira is currently having internet problems. We're gonna continue the show, and if she comes back, great. If she doesn't, then um, we will. I will include some show notes um, after the video. I will include some show notes and then of Mira's opinions because I know she also really wanted to be here and talk about these characters. So um, for those of you that are interested in hearing Mira's opinions, I will include that um, after the fact. Wow. Wait, is, is Mira back? <laughs> Mira, yeah. you're back. Okay, cool. Um, can you just do a quick, like, hello every, to, every, to everyone, Mira? Hello, everyone. Perfect. We got you. Okay, so now that you're back, now I can ask you the question. We've been waiting here. It's been radio silence this whole time. We've been... We're still... We're still... We're still live. Like, you, everyone's... We're still live. Okay, so... um. Mitra, could you please tell us who your favorite character was in the story and why? Uh, mine is a it's a four way tie between the ABCs and Wendy. Wow, nice. and why why do you feel that way? Because they are super cool and they're everything I want to be in life. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome, uh, Kenny girl. You know, the ABCs oh, are rich. Like they're able to go to multiple cruises within a year. They're rich. <laughs> That's true, actually, yeah, because that's yeah. how they know Lacey. <laughs> but Wendy's broke, though, so I don't want to be broke like Wendy. <laughs> do, you, do you want Wendy's travel blog? Like, do you want her, her fan base? I want her confidence. <laughs> okay. And her style. Okay, yeah, nice. But um, I want I want to be as rich as the ABCs. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Candy Girl, how do you feel? Because I know you said that you had similar favorite characters. How do you feel about Meatrest Points? Yeah, those are great points. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Those those are definitely my favorite characters. That's awesome. That's great. I, um, uh, Miro, those are those are great points. And um, I'm, I uh, I want to kind of like push this onto the audience too. For those of you that are listening, um, please let us know who your favorite characters are in the story. Um, feel free to use the comments on YouTube if you want to let us know, or if you're in the Italian Gamer Joe Discord channel. Feel free to also let us know who your favorite characters are in the story. I'm very, very excited to get to read these opinions. Um, my favorite character in the story was George, uh, Nancy's best friend, George. Uh, one of the reasons why I liked George so much is because I feel like she gave the story a lot of comic relief. Um, for example, when they are at the... Um, when they're going to the dinner and George is like, oh, no, I didn't pack any dresses. Do we have to go? I love how she, like, you know, she she just, like, uh, I feel like she breaks up the pacing a little bit and she kind of has her own flair. And I just love whenever she opens her mouth and talks in the story. Um, yeah. Or, like. George is a mood. She's great. She is. And I also like when uh, the next day when they go to the buffet and George is like, wait a minute, are you telling me that we could have gone to the buffet instead of going to that amazing dinner we went to last night? And Bess is like, yes, but we wanted to go to that dinner instead. And George was just so angry for the rest of the <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> Felt. And um, then... They, they should have given, they should have given George a tux or something. I don't know why they forced her into a dress. <laughs> um, I also liked how the, George was like scarfing down like plates and plates, and Nancy and George and Nancy even makes a comment. They're like, Nancy's like, George, finish your food. We gotta go. And George is like, I'm on plate five or something. Like, I was like, where does this come in? This is so funny. <laughs> like, it's cute. I thought it was cute. Like, I I I, I didn't think it. Was, I I just thought it was cute that like, um. I, I, like I said, I've never read the Nancy Drew books, and, like, portraying George as, like, this tomboy character, um, it it really is fun to see George's reactions to things and hear George's, like, comments, and um, she seems like the kind of person that I would totally want to be friends with, like, 
like just like a really fun person that just you know wants to just have just eat like you know five plates of, of scrambled eggs um i also love the part where alan scheduled like a bunch of activities and george looks alan dead in the face and she's like you didn't schedule kayaking yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like love that i loved that like george was and even like after all the activities they come back and george is like that was fun but i'm really sad we didn't go kayaking and she just looks at alan past i was like amazing <laughs> amazing <laughs> um i also yeah, like alan sucks <laughs> i also like the scene where um nancy almost gets killed by the moose antler that almost uh falls on her and straight up george doesn't george doesn't even check if nancy's okay george looks up and she's like hang on nancy i'm gonna climb the moose and she gets on the pylon and starts just hugging the pillar and climbs the the pillar and looks at the moose where it fell and she <laughs> notices that like the screws were loose nancy is like injured on the floor Bess is checking if she's okay and george is like in the pile hugging tree hugging the pylon checking <laughs> the bolts and i'm like I she she is I mean she is like a character basically George said hold on Nancy parkour and then she's like oh wait Nancy <laughs> like if George Don't was worry, Nancy, got this. if George was with Nancy in Ketchikan and she fell George would have probably have like nosedive into the water and like got Nancy out and like wasn't it shallow no it wasn't it was shallower than another part of the water so like it, it was it, it was um it was not the it was not the deepest part i think according to what okay. nancy says yeah um she would have dove into the deepest part and then swam all the way up back to nancy exactly it would have been funny if nancy just straight up died <laughs> that would be horrible <laughs> and then the book just ends there nothing is written after that they, no it's like instead of nancy drew it's george fane by carolyn Keene. yeah no, no, no. Okay, so Nancy falls into the creek, and then the, her POV just ends, and it's Na George's POV. <laughs> but like, she doesn't even think about Nancy. She's like, I need to solve this case, but first, breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, I I love George. I think she is like the the hero that like you know how they say that all not all heroes wear capes. Like, I loved george i thought she was a fantastic character um i love how much personality they gave her in the book and um she made the book for me she honestly made the book for me and it kind of makes me sad because in the nancy drew video games uh we only we, ha we only have george in ransom of the seven ships and it's not even like like they, like they don't give her that personality like they, they give her like like a different personality it seems like um I've learned. I'm not going to talk about this until the ending segment, but um, my perception of the Nancy Drew games have changed a little bit since reading these diaries books, um, especially with Bess and George as well. Um, but overall, I loved George. Probably one of my favorite characters uh, in the entire book. Like, period. Like, completely loved them. Um, I yeah. okay. Going along with Guava and like the sexy men in the book. Um, I thought it was okay. This is not really a favorite character, but it's just a funny character that I thought was interesting. Scar guy, and um, uh, this was this was the guy that like Scott gives money to, and I like I I wrote this down. I'm like large, jagged, ugly scar bisecting it, ripped jeans and plaid flannel jacket, big biceps. I'm like Nancy. <laughs> That's a very descriptive like. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, add, I added the big you. I added the big biceps to it, but yeah, but but still, like okay. Nancy, <laughs> like she really went all the way out there. It's like, how much do you miss Ned? No, I'm kidding. But um, actually, speaking of Ned, like Nancy in this book, straight up, like I haven't talked to Ned in a few days. I should text him. Like what? <laughs> and I'm surprised that Ned didn't text Nancy, unless. Unless Ned did text her and she left him on read or something, but they don't actually explain that. But anyway, um, how about any of you? Do any of you have honorable mentions for any characters that you liked or didn't like? Or no, we won't talk about characters you didn't like yet. But um, any any other favorite characters that all of you liked? Um, uh, hmm. I mean, 
I, I totally agree with you of just how great George is in this book. She really adds like a lot. I feel like George is the MVP of the Clue Crew in this book, and then Bess really shines more in the next book. But I just I'm just really glad that like they're such like a staple in Nancy's stories because they really add a lot. One of, like, second, character. I have to go clean my dog. No problem. She's covered in mud. No problem. We'll um just just let us know when you're back and we'll continue. All right. Uh from that point on. So um so while Meet Res uh stepping out, we're gonna continue the show. Um so now we're gonna jump in to the least favorite character. Um so Guava, I'll start with you. Who was your least favorite character in the story and why? Right. Okay, so I'll say least favorite character. Alan was okay. He he wasn't like my I I didn't hate him as much even though he was like very annoying. He he was kind of just like, you know, there and hanging out, especially in the for, in, in this story. Um I feel like in terms of hating characters, there weren't characters that I didn't like, but there were characters that really didn't leave an impression on me. Uh one is uh this is on this is like on on my part because you you have mentioned the character before but i actually during the part of like with the scar man and like the suspicious person that nancy follows i did i forgot who scott was so she was all like oh what's scott doing here and for a while i just <laughs> couldn't remember who it was but uh another person that we haven't actually talked about yet because at least in this book doesn't really do anything is tatiana who works underneath Becca, and she almost hears what uh, Nancy's talking about, and that's kind of suspicious, but otherwise it doesn't really do much of anything. Uh, and another, just looking through the book while we were talking about this, I forgot about Captain Peterson. He's just there. But <laughs> Yeah, they don't really... Captain Peterson makes a few appearances in the beginning of the book at the at the... Uh, at the dinner, and then he also makes another appearance after Nancy gets hit with the new antler, and then he makes another yeah. appearance at the end of the book, and then just like sprinkled here in between. But uh, yeah, he he doesn't yeah he doesn't exactly make a lot of appearances. You're right. Mm. Becca is definitely the of... person who is illustrating like how worried the cruise is right now, like all the problems. Uh, Captain Peters Peterson like. He, I get he's his whole thing is just like trying to calm everyone down and like keep everything amicable. But he almost does it too well. It's just like he comes in, he's all like, "Oh, don't worry, guys. Like, everything will be fine. Have a free cookie or whatever." And it's like, "Yeah, okay." And he doesn't have <laughs> much else to do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. And then, hello, yeah. Other than that. that. Yeah. Hello. Uh. Other than that, like, I feel like the red hair family was just underused like they appear a lot every once in a while one of them talks but it's like for such like a, a vibrant family basically it's weird that they didn't have but like we didn't know why they were on well they were there for a family reunion but like we didn't know their reactions to things that going on or like what was what was going there they were kind of just like background <laughs> characters and i felt that they could have done more Wait, are you talking group. about the redheaded family that yes. <laughs> were there when Bess or when Nancy fell into the water? <laughs> yeah, they were just like the <laughs> I like how I'm like, Guava, who's your least favorite fell. character in this whole story? And you're like, the redheaded family <laughs> that was there for the family reunion. <laughs> well, I just feel like realize a redheaded yeah. family is that, you know, we know that in book one, Someone is targeting Nancy because you know the note left on her suitcase. What if like someone from the redheaded family accidentally gets you know threatened or whatever because they accidentally mistaken this little redheaded girl that's probably Nancy's age as Nancy for just like a split second? Mm. That's a yeah. good I way mean, to utilize them. That'd be in, that'd be wild. Um, no, but thanks, Bubba, for mentioning those characters because those are characters that you don't actually get to see a lot of uh, throughout the book. Um, Candy Girl, what about you? Who are your least favorite characters and why? Or character, if it's just one. Um, <laughs> Alan. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, I have, like, three characters that I dislike. Okay. Um, uh, Alan is very annoying. 
like obnoxious and I just don't like him. Um, the other character I didn't like was Becca because I just felt like she wasn't putting forth enough effort to meet with Nancy and actually give her like the time of day. Um, and she kept allowing herself to be distracted. Like Tatiana came in and was like, no, you're needed, Becca. You have to go now. Becca should have been like, all right, Tatiana, I'll be there in five minutes. Like, I don't know. Becca's in charge. She should have been like, um, I don't know. She just didn't, uh, like she, she didn't kind of take charge of the situation. Like she wasn't a leader in those situations. She would rely on the captain Peterson. Was it? She rely Last on. One. Sorry. <laughs> Was that again, Kenny? Yeah. Go? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. She. Yeah. I um, really like was Brock Walker. Okay. Uh, because he's just a chicken for not coming on the cruise because he got huh. a dumb email. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he is a celebrity, so like he should have gotten plenty of those emails before. And think about how many haters he might have. I mean, I mean, let's just face it: celebrities do have haters. I mean, does he cancel entire tours <laughs> after one email? Yeah. It's a good point. And I think girl. the book would have been more interesting if there had been a celebrity on the cruise. Exactly. Yeah. And they could have done more with him. On Wait, the cruise. we had Merc the Jerk. <laughs> sure. You're an did you really celebrity. know? <laughs> we. Yeah, I, I guess it's we like, did. It's like going to um, going to a cruise and be like, oh, you know, Harry Styles from One Direction was going to be on the cruise, but then he flaked. But don't worry, we got Chris Rock. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. No, no, it's... no, not even Chris Rock's Dave Chappelle. <laughs> <laughs> uh... And his like fifty billion transphobic jokes. No, it's Dave Chappelle, but it's but it's a FaceTime. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> he just FaceTimes his way into there. Sorry, I got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you're not even like the full, and then they still, and then the cruise still charges like money for that show, <laughs> for the for the FaceTime. Bucks. Yeah, fifty um, bucks to be on the Zoom call. <laughs> and the Zoom call has poor internet. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> okay. Anyway, so we're gonna continue. Um, so yeah, uh, as far as my least favorite character, um, my least favorite character was Alan all the way. I dislike alan so much <laughs> flames flames on the side of my face <laughs> flames <laughs> eating breaths yeah <laughs> <laughs> i just i couldn't stand him he's so obnoxious he is i mean like i i tried i tried to like him i tried to assume that he was comedic relief, but it, it it's just bad. And like whoever wrote, whoever wrote, I mean, someone wrote Alan's character. Like, think about that for a second. Someone wrote this character. I, I was feel, like, ah, oh, yes, it's perfect. I feel bad I feel for like whoever me. wrote this character because I hope that person did not have an ex boyfriend that was I like that. I feel like that. it was very intentional how annoying they made him. <laughs> It was really it's bad. Very well done. It <laughs> on you. It was me. <laughs> Mira, Mira's like, I'm Carolyn Keene. <laughs> but yeah, I did not like Alan um, for many, many reasons. And one, my biggest reason for not liking Alan, uh, without spoiling the second book, uh, is that Alan is just very, like, he, he just has red flags as a boyfriend. Like, he's very, like, has to know what everyone's doing, what everyone's doing at all times. If someone, God forbid, goes to the bathroom, he freaks out. Um, he's, like, very clingy in a way that's, like, a little bit, um, like, um, I mean, okay, like, being a little bit clingy, I understand, but he takes it to the next level. And to the point where Nancy and Bess and George have to, like, come up with excuses to get rid of him. And I get they were trying to solve a case, but, like... He has no level of independence at all. Like, um, like, 
he wanted to go explore the rock climbing wall, but never got the chance to do it, be, oh, except for the time when Tobias wanted to do it. It's like, if you're going to be in a cruise ship vacation, you know, like, I... I feel okay. Like if you're dating someone as well, you want to do activities with them, but there may be times where you maybe want to do something that your significant other may not want to do or may not be interested in. Why should that stop you from going and doing those things? If there's free time, um, or if your significant other just doesn't want to do those things and they are okay with you going and checking out those things or I, I don't know. I'm just, I, I feel like Alan, they, they wrote him to be so like, um, Clingy clingy and like very almost like a to a psychotic point where he was just a very <laughs> it, it it was like almost sociopathic like how clean like, like how they made him and it it i feel like and and i can't i can't i, can't, I mean i don't know if i'm like it's just it's mind-boggling to me wh- like how, why they did that and all of us in this podcast were suspicious of him all of us so like it, it's just they really went to the next level when they made like like when I think of Alan, I think of Penelope from the Amanda show where Penelope's like, I have Amanda's, you know, like hair and I have this tissue that he's that she sneezed in. Like that's how I felt like with Alan, like just being so overly obsessed with everything and what everyone's doing and like the fact that they had to get him to like go and they had to lie to him to get him to leave. Like it's just yeah, I don't know. It's just next level. Um but uh, that's that's how I feel about Alan. Um, does anyone have any points before? I feel like I'm talking a lot about Alan. Does anyone agree, or does anyone have any? Does anyone disagree? I feel like we can ask Mitra, who her least favorite character is now. That's a good point, actually. Did I, Mitra? I don't think I asked you yet. Um, Mitra, how do you feel about my points about Alan, and and then we'll segue into that. <laughs> so, Mitra, how do you feel about what I just said, and um. Who is your least favorite character? Is Meet right here anymore? I don't know. I'm here. I'm oh, okay. Here. <laughs> I, I was just talking to my mom. Oh, no problem. Did you hear anything from the... I heard, I heard okay. li- little bits of it. Okay, but... so basically I'll just like summarize it. I did not like Alan because I think he was just a really... Um, I Okay... I don't want to spoil the second book, but I really did not like Alan. And I think a lot of his behavior in the first book just makes him come across as just very clingy and very just like very dependent. And it's it and that and those behaviors made me suspicious of him. And when it turned out in the first book that he kind of like that he wasn't the culprit or like all our suspicions were wrong, it really threw me off guard and it it made me rethink his character and but but they didn't really give us any payoff either they didn't give us any backstory they didn't give us anything to work with for his character period like it's just this is alan he's a little bit crazy he's a little bit clingy and he comes across as very suspicious and that's one of the big reasons why i just didn't like him um how do you feel about that do i know you don't like alan either like do you feel the same way and also who is your least favorite character um, I hated him so much. I agree with everything that you said. Plus, also, he gives me the vibes of someone who would be, like, a fake feminist to get girls, and then when he gets what he wants, he just straight up, like, ditches them. You know? I feel yeah, like he's it's... using Bess, and that's just the vibes that I got from him, and I hated him. Um, but, you know besides all that besides uh, okay obviously alan's my least favorite character that's super obvious i made it obvious throughout my entire interaction with this book but then when it comes to like my second least favorite character it was becca (laughs) candy girl pointed out and i'm like dude that's the exact same reason why i didn't like becca is that you know she was just so all over the place she wanted nancy to help her but she was like giving her like the bare minimum of information and I'm like, girl, you hired this, uh, you hired Nancy to do this job. You need to help her in some way. She's like, Nancy, I need your help. Whoop, well, I'm out. Yeah, that's basically the whole thing that happened. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, um, I, yeah, absolutely. And, like, um, can we all agree that Alan just needs, like, 
some mental health counseling or like a therapist or something. <laughs> he needs all the therapy. He needs he needs help. Um, I do, I do have some. Uh, I'm not gonna say defenses for Alan, but defenses for Becca at least. <laughs> but uh, with Becca, I think what they were trying to come across with is he was worried about the crew is basically like being torn down and like all of the problems so she had to work extra hard to like make to make sure everything was going on while also doing her best to give Nancy what little she had. I think the reason why it didn't work it didn't feel that way is because the whole crew's other than like a few couple mishaps like and like the one argument in in the sh in the kitchen like no one was no like no one was none of the crew were actually like worried like i was talking about how captain peterson was just like pretty pretty calm in the face of like all of the problems going on so it really made becca seem like the odd one out of just like she's so worried about what's going on and then not giving nancy anything and it's like at some like if things are really bad then you need to either tell Nancy that, like, I need to make sure the ship isn't going to, like, go under, or just go help Nancy, because once Nancy helps you, then the ship will stop being in trouble, because that's the whole reason why you hired her. Yeah. And then, with Alan, uh, the vibe I got from him was uh, that joke in, uh, in sitcoms you get, where you have a whole episode of like people doing a thing like going to a convention and then you realize that there was another person who was there that whole time and it'll go back <laughs> to a scene of like someone talking and it'll shift the camera to the right the guy's like are we having so much fun guys that's that's what i thought alan was to me uh, I think, yeah i think everything to do with like becca and why uh, not becca with bess and why he started dating bess like those are like huge red flags and like is really confusing but his actions on his own on the ship at least in the first book i could i could like go you know what fine if Bess is okay with him then he's probably okay i just think he's like some sad dog who <laughs> desperately wants friends and everyone just keeps pushing him off but he keeps coming back that's kind of how i figured him i agree with then, you Oh, Over ahead, the sorry. course of the time, it got more annoying. Yeah, sorry. I completely on. agree with you, and I appreciate that you bring all that up to like kind of like, kind of like a devil's advocate a little bit with Alan. Um, and I I agree with you. I I, I really wish that the that Carolyn Keene. I'm just gonna use the author Carolyn Keene. I wish that that they would have given Alan some kind of backstory or something to make his character more relatable. Or some some kind of like evidence to give him some more suspicion, but just just to kind of like you know not make us be so skeeved by him, because yeah. like uh, His relationship it, it's frustrating. With was kind of cute. I'll also, say that they mentioned the fact that Bess and Alan had only been dating a week before he forced himself onto the trip. So I'm like, that's really suspicious. Was that was really a week? Was just a week? I thought oh, it was geez. like a month. Oh, yeah. No, it was a week. Yeah. Imagine dating someone for a week and being like, oh, you're going on a cruise? I want to go. I bought a ticket. Like, wait, what? <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck? They're like, they're, it was like super weird. The fact that, mm. you know, they've been only dating a week. They mentioned it somewhere in the book that they've only been dating a week when he, when he you know, forced himself into the conversation to be like, invite me. I'm an eco sci major. And I'm like Deeper Boy. desperate. <laughs> Boy, I'm about to yeah. beat you. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I agree. I, I think that the way they wrote Alan, I I just wish they like I said, I wish they would have given him more of a backstory. Like, I wish they would have given him more of um something to work with because without it, he just comes across as a creep. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, one character that I also want to bring up, one honorable mention that I did not like, um, was Verity Salinas, Selena, Selene, I can't pronounce it, Verity Salinas, and she is the CEO of the Superstar Cruise Ship. She dismisses these as just pranks and doesn't want to get the authorities involved. 
but she's totally okay with Becca bringing on her 18-year-old detective. Uh, amateur sleuth detective with no... Yeah. And she's totally okay with that. But, like... I'm just I, I I have to like suspend my disbelief of all this to read to finish the book, but like, really, like you don't want to get the police involved with these accidents, or a detective that's like, I don't, I, but you're totally okay with like Becca bringing on Nancy as like, and I know that Nancy is like a famous sleuth at this point, like she's got credentials, very 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 good credentials, but like. I'm just shocked that Ver- Ver- Verity, the CEO, wouldn't consider upping the security on the ship or using more security measures for employees or for something. And I know that this is a mystery, and they kind of have to do it that for- they have to do that to write it a certain way. But like, it's like, geez, Verity, like, you know that your ship it might be go- like your this is your first ever like reveal for your cruise ship. You know, your first ever state of the art cruise. You're not going to up security a little bit. Like, shame on you. <laughs> Hire some more security. Like, you know, have some kind of protocol or something. Like, I don't know. It, that that threw me off a bit. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, and then she's never even mentioned at all in the book. Like, just one time in one conversation with Becca, and that's it. I had to remember. She girlball gatekeeps. Uh, no, she gaslight gatekeep girlballs her way to the sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I yeah, interesting characters. Um mm. but um yeah, I so does any do any of you by any chance have any honorable mention characters that you want to talk about before we end the segment? Um I think that's all. Uh Hazel is a great spider and I wish her all the best. <laughs> Uh, okay. Max kind of freaked me out for a second because he was like a bit weird. Oh, always oh, yeah, smiling. Max. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure he's a nice person, but that smiling <laughs> thing just kind of <laughs> threw me off. I mean, the fact that like with the luggage, I think it was mainly the luggage, like that when that stuff went wrong, like he was very apologetic about. It, but it's like yeah, yeah he I, acts a certain he... way, but then the results are kind of lacking. Yeah, and I'm like, just imagine if it was Brock. Brock would have straight up been like, "You're fired. Get yeah. out." <laughs> Bye. But this is Nancy. Yeah, I want to take the time to for my honorable mention to be uh, Daisy, the waitress in Chapter Five at the dinner. She seemed very lovely. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Daisy was great. <clears throat> yeah, and then of course Mr. Phillips, the maitre d, that had to be like Nancy. That camera crew are filming commercials. <laughs> oh yeah, that was a fun scene. Bad. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, they really had to introduce two new characters for this. <laughs> also, yeah. honorable mentioned that fake moose that almost killed Nancy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amazing, or like Claude, the camera crew director. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't the one of the one of the camera people was like Indians, and then Nancy's all like, "He's suspicious," and I'm like, "Nancy, you're racist." Oh my gosh, that's really? Perez. That's Perez, and that's the one who I I liked my favorite. Character. Oh, Perez, right? I was yeah, Perez, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. See, I was gonna say, was like, there's something about him. He just seems like a really cool guy. I just really like. Mira, him. I think Nancy was actually checking him out because Guava mentioned <laughs> that. Guava, didn't you just mention that Nancy says something about him being handsome or something? Well, oh, she says everyone is it handsome. Was, yeah, it was partly just me, but she <laughs> mentions two burly cameramen coming down along with Claude, the director, or whatever. And then when you hear the name Baraz, it's just like, wow, this guy seems cool. And you find out he's seasick. He's like, he's delicate, like great guy, sensitive. Uh, if Carolyn Keene ever listens to this podcast, I'm imagining them like pulling Breaking a out. copy of the book, being like, "Did we say those men were burly and handsome? <laughs> what? What? Like what?" <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I just blacked out for like five minutes reading that and <laughs> came back in. <laughs> you just wake up, Guava, from your dream. You're like, I just had a dream about a handsome cameraman named Baraz. Mm. He took me on a nice dinner. But yeah, Nancy's Moose like, Hitler fell on me. Suspicious. He was filming stuff, and I'm like, Nancy, you're just racist. <laughs> also, can we talk about the fact that Alan thought he was fitting in by playing volleyball with the cameraman? <laughs> like, Ooh, I'm gonna play he volleyball with the cameraman. Friend. What was that? Yeah. He just wants a friend. I I'm missed sure that the cameraman trounced him. 
Oh, okay, oh yeah, I, yeah. He he just wanted a friend, like anybody at this point. Yeah, I know, right? Like he just yeah. Um. Well, okay. So now, just like we did last time, we're gonna talk about our zero to four star reviews of the characters. So, um, I will start with Guava. From zero to four stars, how do you rank the characters in the book? Okay, so I was going to stick with two just because it's the same problem of there's a lot of really cool characters who only shine in the second book. But if we're thinking about only the first, this book specifically, uh, we get a lot of really great George moments. uh, Some pretty good, like, moments from like the abcs and i think just because of all of like the minor male characters <laughs> that are given descriptions by nancy i will give it this the characters a three uh, okay so you're giving it a three okay yeah. um candy girl how about you how would you rate the characters overall in the book um i also give it a three um i thought there were some interesting characters some fun characters some annoying characters um but overall there were just too many characters i thought so um that's why i didn't give it more than three okay and mitra how about you um from zero to four stars how would you rate the characters overall in this book i rated them four out of four wow of course yeah okay and um, what's your reasoning because my reasoning was that each individual character are so unique and distinct that um, I do not mistake them for any other character. And that's like the main ones, not like the side one. The side ones, almost all all of them just kind of mesh into this one person. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, um, uh, Daisy, or what was her name? Daisy and Iris, you know, the flower girls. They <laughs> meshed into one, one maid, and so when they're like, oh... Iris is not her maid. Daisy is, and I'm like, huh? Who's who? Right? Yeah. <laughs> now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like the if main ones. Like, Latino, when I'm talking about the main noticed. ones, when I'm talking about the main one, it's Wendy, Tobias, Tobias's parents, um, uh, Hero, Scott, Nancy, George, Bess, Alan, and uh, the honeymooners. They were all very distinct. Oh, and also Hawaiian shirt guy. They're all very distinct. I could tell the difference between them, and I, I was you know they were very engaging. Absolutely, um, yeah. yeah. Thank thank you for that for that one. Um, I think that's, I think that's the first time we've ever gotten or in the in the in, in the conception that I've had the show or as long as I've had it, I think it's the first time we've ever had someone on the show that's given a review a rating of four out of four, uh, for a segment. So. Congratulations! <laughs> no, but, uh, no, that's really cool. I'm really happy to hear that. That's I'm glad you. I'm glad the characters um, uh, impacted you, and I'm glad that you um, that you think that they are all very unique in their own way. And um, if a book can do that, if a book can give you unique characters that you truly resonate with, um, then that's that's great. That's that's awesome. Like very well done on the writers. Um, as far as my rate rating, I I struggled. I struggled because I I like the characters. I think they. I agree with Mitra. They are very very memorable, especially like the ABCs. Um, George, God, fantastic. ABCs. My favorite character. <laughs> as much as I hate Alan, I love that I hate him. Like I love that the I love that I like that the that the writers gave me that reaction to Alan. Um. Coming from the Nancy Drew video games, I'm so used to having three to four suspects to talk to that when I came into this book, I was expecting something similar, like, you know, having a smaller suspect list. And um, the more I read the book and the more my suspect roster got larger and larger and larger and larger, it it was very um, mind boggling to me to wrap my head around all of these characters to the point that I even created a Google doc to just like write all of these characters. Um, and you know, when it comes to being like, when it comes to writing, you know, a story and having all these characters, I think the biggest problem 
is giving enough screen time for all of these characters. And there are so many situations in the story where I wish that some characters would have gotten more screen time than others, like the ABCs or um, like more Bess and George. Um, instead, we get a whole lot of Tobias, not a lot of Wendy. Um, there's so many characters to keep up with that it's really hard to um, to get like backstories or to get like anything more from them. And um, for that, for that, for me, for that reason alone, I have to give it a rating of two out of four stars for the characters. Um, that this like, me, like just like you said in a previous segment, how your rating changed in the second book. Um, my rating would have to jump up to a three for the second book, but I, I, I will probably talk about that in a future episode. But um, as of like, you know, leaving this book from the, for, like, you know, with the characters that we were given, I have to give it a two. Um, only because like we, I feel like we didn't get enough. And for what we did get, they're just, um, it was very surface level. And I, I, I had having to wrap my brain around all of these characters, like 20, it, it was just a lot to keep up with. Um, but, uh, yeah, th th that's pretty much my overall opinion on the characters. Um, it seems like we have some polarizing opinions though. And I love that we'd have polarizing opinions of the characters segment. Um, it's really cool to hear all of your opinions. Um, do any of you have any other, uh, notes you want to talk about before we, uh, take a break and go on to the ending? I think... That's all for me. Okay. Um, Candy Girl and Mitra, are you both all good? And then we'll just move on to the ending, or do you have any other notes you want to talk about? <laughs> uh, for I, the characters. You know, I'm going to be honest. Uh, when you mentioned that, you know, Scott was your, your initial suspect, um, throughout the entire book, I forgot Scott existed. Yeah, I yeah. also did. So. He only showed up in chapter one, and then after that, he didn't come back till Ketchikan. Yeah. yeah, when he was very, um, oh, so that's why, because he was that suspicious character, and, like, the whole time I was just like, but wait, which one is Scott, though? Because <laughs> Max is the other guy, and then, yeah. He comes back in Chapter 8. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So also, it's, it's a good... what made the Honeymooners super suspicious is that they were the only people still on the boat. Yeah. True. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was very suspicious. Everyone was off the boat, they were the only ones still on the boat, and I'm like, hmm, interesting. Why would you still want to be on the boat if you're saying, oh, so much bad stuff is happening? Also, like, I love the part where, I, I, don't, know if, I don't know if it was George or Bess, but um, I'm going to say it's George. George makes a comment where she's like, you know, I, we would have believed it if you said you were in your room, like, making love or something like that. <laughs> as, instead of being at the gym. <laughs> or, I, I'm pretty, pretty sure it was George that said that. And yeah. I, I, I was just like, oh my god, George, George, George. <laughs> <laughs> and like um I, I don't know I, I just thought it was a really funny scene because um uh it, it just goes to show that you know like um it, it just goes to show like the personalities of these characters are actually pretty strong um which is why I have to give it some some stars for these characters because some of them are actually really really um really great in the story um Kenny Girl, did you have any other comments, or are you um, you ready for the ending? <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, everyone it seems okay. So everyone's ready. Um, we're gonna take a really short break, uh, but when we come back, we will talk about the ending of Nancy Drew: Curse of the Arctic Star. Um, that will be our uh, next segment. We're talking about the ending of Nancy Drew: Curse of the Arctic Star. Stay tuned. We will be back very soon. Welcome back, everybody, to the Italian Gamer Joe Show, a.k.a. the Italian Gamer Joe Podcast. Tonight, we are reviewing Nancy Drew Diaries, Curse of the Arctic Star. This is the first book in the Nancy Drew Diaries 
series. I have three amazing, lovely people here tonight. Nancy Drew game fans, Nancy Drew book fans, Nancy Drew fans all the way. They are your one-stop shop to Nancy Drew content, and they are fantastic people. We have Guava Jagular, we have Mitra, and we have the Candy Girl. How are you all doing uh, tonight? Um, are you all having a lot of fun with this episode so far? We got some great, fantastic opinions. How are you all doing? Oh, yes. It's been very fun. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, lots of fun. Awesome. Yeah, love beating up on Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the segment that we're going to jump into now is the last segment of the show, which is the ending. Um I have three. I have two questions that I'm going to be asking all of you. The first question that I'm going to be asking you, and uh, I'll be also talking about myself, is did you like the ending? So um, at the end of the book, at the very, very end of the book, chapter 12, which is labeled Busted, uh, Nancy has a eureka moment. She rushes to the cruise liner's gym, and she confirms with a personal trainer there that Vince and Lacey were not at the gym at all um, during, for their alibi. Nancy also spots Hawaiian shirt guy on the treadmill, and she makes a big deal about it. I don't know why, but she's like, ooh, Hawaiian shirt guy's over there, and he looks like he needs to get off the treadmill. And I'm like, what? Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> like, Nancy, this reminds me of Clue with Mr. Wadsworth, where like she brings people around, like the man, like where Wadsworth brings people around the mansion, and it's like Nancy just gets the point. <laughs> Why are you going up to Hawaiian shirt man? <laughs> like, let him go, leave him alone. <laughs> so then, um, Nancy meets with Becca, Captain Peterson, and security at the spa. Everyone's wondering why this is happening. And they catch Vince and Lacey sabotaging the bottles. Uh, Vince and Lacey admit to being the culprits. Um, Iris is also arrested. Uh, Iris is Vince and Lacey's maid. Um, Iris stole Hazel. Um, however, there's some interesting plot points here. Vince claims that no one messed with the moose's bolts. Um... And also had nothing to do with the mysterious note. So there were some plot points that actually did not get resolved. Um, Nancy goes back to the catch can police station to give her accounts. Uh, they all celebrate when they come back. Um, but the celebration is short-lived when Becca informs the group that the ship's jewelry store got robbed. <laughs> which reveals that a second culprit hasn't been copped on the ship. And I don't know, I'm laughing because like it was just it was just out of the blue. <laughs> Becca just runs up and she's like, Nancy, <laughs> it's not over yet. Um, so then um, we find Alan. Alan claims to be in town while Nancy and the team were in town, which was a little bit sus. And then the book just ends. Like, the book just ends on a total cliffhanger. And Nancy being like, Dear diary, this is not going to end yet. <laughs> it's not, I can't relax yet. So, um, my first question is, did you like the ending? I'll start by saying that I thought the reveal at the end was great. I liked the whole Nancy Wadsworth situ situation, um, where she's running around the cruise ship and everyone's running after her. Like, I'm imagining Nancy, like, in a full sprint, being like, and George and Bess and, like, Captain Pierce and Becca are like, Nancy, we can't do this. Just tell us what the problem, just tell us who it is. Um, and Nancy's like, we're almost there. <laughs> like, just bolting to the spa. Um, and you know, I almost didn't catch the ABC reference. I, I almost did not catch the ABC reference of, um, the ABCs calling out Lacey for being the singer. Um, to I I'm glad I caught it, but I was really shocked. One thing that really shocked me, though, was that I was not expecting Iris to be a culprit. Iris being a culprit, like, shook me. I was shooketh. I was like, wait, there's a third culprit? Um, so that threw me off. The cliffhanger also shocked me. I thought it was going to end, but, yeah, when I when when Nancy at the end was like, dear diary, this isn't over yet, I, I and the whole jewelry store thing, like, I was just, I, I was like, okay, well, this is great, because I was happy and sad at the same time. Um, um, another thing that I... Th thought was interesting was when Nancy got pushed in the water um, it, it was a great like it was a great like scene but Nancy doesn't really follow up on it she doesn't investigate who pushed her she kind of just leaves it alone and 
She's like, yeah, it just happens. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. She's like, I got pushed, but I'm not going to follow up on it. I'm not going to interrogate anyone. I'm not going to go back to catch can with any little time that I have left. No, I'm going to have this eureka moment and catch, like, <laughs> it's just out of the blue completely. Like, just eureka. Like, like the cold water must have, like, like triggered some kind of, like, you know, a crazy response in her. And she's like, I know who did it. Um, and then Nan- say her friends do tend to be like, oh, it's probably nothing, Nancy. It's it's probably just an accident. It's fine. It's like, I know you're not gaslighting, but it does feel like it. Cause it, it's like, Please it does. Please care about Nancy. And then Nancy also, like, didn't follow up with Becca and Hero because there were some more Becca Hero moments. And she just did not follow up on them. She doesn't follow up on the st- on the threatening note with her le- with her baggage. She doesn't. Vince claimed he had nothing to do with the moose bolts, and Nancy does not follow up on that. There were just so many things left unturned, and it, it was just jarring to me. Overall, I liked the ending. I did, but there was just so many plot points that had me screaming at my audiobook and screaming at the book. I'm like, what the hell, like. Really? Um, so that was my that was my um, interpretation of the ending. Uh, but anyway, I'm gonna leave this open. Does anyone want to volunteer as tribute to talk about their opinion of the ending? I do. Okay, me right. Um, go ahead. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you hate it? Uh, it's just super underwhelming. Because, you know, I'm used to, like, you know, the endings and the Nancy Drew games where it's, like, high stakes, you know. Nancy has to, you know, life in danger, stuff like that. This one's just, like, it was you. And then they're, like, oh, you caught me. And then that's it. And I'm, like, that was just super lame to me. You know? I had to mute myself because I was blowing my nose. And then when you're, like, oh, you caught me, I just, like, (laughs) from, like... (laughs) <laughs> I mean, dude, but like you know the, the it was just I, yeah. it was so underwhelming like, oops to me. you caught me it's yeah and like i agree with you it's like they didn't even like fight it they were just like oh yeah or the culprits like what or like you know i guess like you know i'm expecting high stakes kind of situation but this is like you know they're sabotaging a cruise ship you know they were like if they were gonna get caught they were gonna be like yeah it was us but like you know i was like that's a little more yeah, like, I was expecting some kind of, like, Phoenix Wright situation where Nancy would be like, Objection, Your Honor! And really, it's just, like, Becca, and, like, they're like, what's what's the objection, Nancy? And then they're like, you know, and then Nancy gives evidence, and then you hear, like, a Nancy Drew, like, objection theme or something. But anyway, this isn't Phoenix Wright, this is Nancy Drew. But, um, <laughs> yeah, like, I was expecting something similar, and, like, yeah, no, it, it was, I agree, I agree with you, Mira. Um, but, yeah, so you hated the ending, then? Mm-hmm. Okay. I did. Okay. Um, Guava, you're next. How do you feel about the ending? Uh, I wasn't actually too down on the ending that much. Uh, I will say, like, as the mystery worked, like, it, it fit re- pretty well. I liked being... I, I liked before she had her big moment, I was able to, like, go back and think, like, okay, who could have done this? And... The reveal that it was, like, Lacey and Vince, uh, it all, like, fit. It all made sense. Like, it wasn't, like, a huge, a random change of pace or anything. Uh, I do think... And honestly, I kind of appreciate that there was stuff... uh, uh, That there was still stuff unsolved because it left Nancy feeling very, like, confused. And... That's like a nice. That's I, I like that kind of. I think it does work as a cliffhanger of Nancy being like, "What's going on? Why?" Like, there's the problem with the ship, but there's also for some reason like a personal problem like happening to Nancy, and that's kind kind of eerie in a way, uh, and it makes the motives a bit more complex of like what's going to happen uh, next. Uh, I do think in general like this like. To the point of like it not being pretty underwhelming like it's the ending of the first like the second act it's not the ending of like the whole story in total really so it does so it definitely feels like uh 
everything happening in the cruise is kind of like secondary and that's kind of annoying because that's what the entire book was about <laughs> so being like at the end of the day it's just like yeah so uh i think the worst i think one thing i would have changed is the big final uh it really is just a prank like the final prank that Lacey is, are, is doing it's like itching powder in the lotion it's like i feel like there could have been like a build-up to something that really goes like this last thing that they do is going to like sink the ship for good like not maybe not literally but like well destroy the ship's reputation but no it's just like another small time prank that really just like adds to the feeling of like and that's it Absolutely. I agree with you on that 100%. It, it's 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 a little bit jarring cuz I, I mentioned this in previous segments that the accidents are kind of a roller coaster of like in, from like minor inconvenience to could have injured or killed someone back to minor convenience back to like and so on and so forth. And um I think what I found so interesting about that is um it it kind of it kept things mysterious. It kept things like, um, like you didn't know what was going to happen next. But I think it would have been more effective, and which is what you're saying as well. Like if the accidents could have become more gradually, more and more intense as the story continued, um, and uh, especially with the first chapter where they show the mannequin in the pool with the, with the blood. Like, I think if they would have, like, started with, like, th that was great. And then maybe, like, you know, started from inconvenient and slowly worked their way up to something more spooky and, and dangerous. Like, that would have been way more uh, fun. But, like, yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. So, um, but you, but overall, though, Guava, you do, like, you did, like, the ending, right? Like, you did enjoy it then? Yeah, at, at, at the very least, like, on its own. Uh, at the very least, like just reading through it, I was like, "Oh yeah, that was that that worked well." Uh, it was I didn't I wasn't ecstatic about it, but like, it was a it was a decent ending. Okay. And the candy girl, how do you feel about the ending? I very much did not like the ending. I pretty much agree with Mitra. Um, it was just very lackluster, like kind of like what you were just saying I think it would have been better like if they had ended with the chandelier everybody's coming back from their excursion they're coming back onto the ship they file in and then the chandelier falls down and that's whenever everything comes about and they're caught and instead we have them like just tampering with products in the salon which I think is just yeah I agree it could have been like so much better but the biggest thing for me that I didn't like is that we are left with literally half of the mystery unsolved and it just ends <laughs> yeah and it's it's um mind-boggling to me that carolyn keen made that decision to end the book on such a big cliffhanger it's like that tv show season you watch where you finish the finale and you're like wait what now I have to wait a whole. I have to wait a whole year ago to to watch this show. I <laughs> sat mean? through you mean twelve I episodes for nothing. <laughs> it's like the stranger is on the money. It's like the Stranger Things. Why they split it up? <laughs> it's like the Stranger Things finale, which I'm not going to spoil here. But oh. it's like it's like they end it on such a crazy cliffhanger, and now we have to wait till 2025, 2024 for the next season. Like what? Um, that's well, kind of how it felt. Came out at the same time. <laughs> yeah, so, Guava, Thank you for yeah. for for figuring that out. That information. Imagine being a kid though, like and like reading that book. Imagine being younger and reading that book and having to be like, "Mom, Dad, can you buy me the second book?" <laughs> yeah. Imagine being like, "Okay, you can only pick one of these books. We can't take both of them." Like, no. <laughs> or imagine like getting it at your library and being like, "Can we go back to the library?" <laughs> Mom, yeah. you need to go back to the library. I need to get that second book, please. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, it, okay. So cliffhangers and books is fine, but it's literally the first book. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it would have been fine if it was like you know, 
uh, like more in the middle or near the end it would have been fine or they could have even done it like full on like uh what's it called uh like the mystery incorporated series there's like little hints to like there's like one bigger mystery that is happening in the background and then like all the books are just connected up until like the very last few books then it's that massive mystery and then that could have been the two-parter mm. oh i should write books <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but now then we're just gonna... like you have to like write out the entirety of the series before you do anything no i mean yeah, it's I, yeah. and th that's why it's fun talking about these books because you know it, it, it's it's fun getting the chance to um, to analyze them further because it, it really it really inspires a lot of analysis and reflection here. And Mitra, I'm really glad that you resonate with that. Um, Quavo, what were you gonna say? Oh yeah, I just think like in the context of knowing that it's basically the first half of two books, like it's easier to be to be okay with the ending. But if you're coming into this like the new series of Nancy Drew books and you start off and your first impression is the first book, it would feel very underwhelming, I think, especially with the way it starts uh, with the body in the pool. And then the ending is just that kind of ending. Uh, like, cause you want what you, you would want is for people to go, Oh, well I need to like read the second book. And the only way it really does that is by is through the cliffhanger, but there isn't really any big spectacle of like, this is what Nancy can do. Yeah, that's that's true. <clears throat> Agreed. Um, so they, so yeah, thank you for all of your opinions on the ending. So um, I think now is a good time to talk about the conclusion. So um, here, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just transition to the next question, which is the finale. Um, so how many stars would you rate the book overall? And do you recommend this book? Um, so for me, I would have to give the book an overall total of three stars out of four. Um, I, um, I think that the book did a really good job at like, for being an introduction to the modern Nancy Drew mysteries. Um, I think it does a good job at, uh, being, I, I like that. It's I like that it's a vacation. Um, I like that it's enticing, especially on the cover of the book. We see Nancy uh, standing outside the cruise, like her. She's looking out into the water. Uh, she, her actual like illustration of herself. She looks older. She looks more mature. Um, I love the way the cover of the book looks, and um, I think that when it comes to like the story itself, um, I think that. Um, I think the book did, did a really good job at like, you know, giving us all of these little mysteries that we're trying to solve. But as far as like, you know, certain characters, certain plot points, pacing, uh, certain situations um, that, that just didn't line up like completely. I, I and even like continuity, I, I think that um, it could have been better. It could have been it could have been better. But as an introduction to the Nancy Drew Diaries. I think it's a good starting point. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think that uh, they do a really good job at uh, modernizing the Nancy Drew mysteries. Because most people, they think of Nancy Drew, they think of the 1930s character. And, you know, since, and as far as Nancy Drew content, we have the games, but then we also have the, uh, like, the more kids oriented books. So to have a modern Nancy Drew book that, it, that portrays Nancy as a um, a young adult that takes place in modern day and age where it's cell phones and, and computers and um, uh, social media and all that kind of stuff. I think it's really, really cool that we have a modern Nancy Drew series. And I think that this book, if anything, serves as a great introduction into this newer version of Nancy. And although, I also, I also just, you know, I love George. George is amazing and we need to bring back George loved her um and uh yeah i'm just looking forward to reviewing the second book um so that so yes and i would recommend this nancy drew book overall um so that's my opinion uh <clears throat> candy girl how about you uh what over what is your overall uh score in from zero to four stars of the book and would you recommend this book to someone
Sorry, Candy Girl, are you there? She's been kidnapped. Okay, then we will skip Candy Girl for now. Um, Mitra, let's uh, transition over to you. Mitra, how many stars would you give the book overall? And do you recommend this book to someone? I gave this book a two, uh, two star. Um, that that <laughs> that ending really brought that book down. Uh, I gave it two stars. I would recommend this book to beginner Nancy Drew readers. Um, I feel like it's a good introduction into the series. Um, little sad that they didn't utilize a little bit more modern elements into her mystery solving. Um, but yeah, I would recommend this book to someone. But, you know, if they're like hardcore Nancy Drew fans, probably not. Okay, yeah. And, um, just to just to follow up on that, um, so why do you think hardcore Nancy Drew fans would not like the book? Um, just is just uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's just you know, there's some fans that like don't like the any changes to their precious lore or whatever and their ca precious characters. So then, me included. So like you know, I had to like bear my way, uh, like grin bear my way through it, but. You know, it, it's good, but, you know, it's not as good as the Yellow Books. Okay, yeah. And um, it's kind of cool because I haven't read the Yellow Books yet, so um, it's cool, like, hearing your thoughts because um, you have experience reading the Yellow Books, and um, it's interesting hearing that you kind of prefer the Yellow Books in this specific, also, specific situation. Also, the cover art of the Yellow Books is so much better. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like in it's the classic. yellow books, they make Nancy look like an adult, where in the book... She looks like a kid! She looks like a child! <laughs> she, and they're yeah. like, oh, I'm in college. And I'm like, huh? Yeah, you? they make Nancy look a little bit younger, and I, I, I wish they would just make her look like an adult. Like, they... It's like, Carolyn Keene, please, like... Like, just make her mature. Like, I mean... Like, I go to Barnes & Noble... Okay, and like the Nancy Drew books are tucked away in the young adult readers section in the very back on the very last shelf. It's like, I mean, I feel like, you know, just just make Nancy mature, like just make her a more mature looking character. Um, it's disappointing to me that that like the demand of the Nancy Drew books, uh, at least from the Barnes and Noble perspective, is like that low shelf in the very back of the store. But like. Um, I think they really should reconsider their audience because a lot of the Nancy Drew fans are a little bit older. Um, and it's like, I don't know, the one thing I always bring up for the games and the books, or specifically the games though, is like, when I was in third grade playing Nancy Drew Message in a Haunted Mansion, one of the big reasons why I loved it so much is because we are playing as an adult. Like, we are, Nancy Co. goes in there as an adult detective, and what is the one thing kids want to do when they're younger? They want to grow up. <laughs> they want to be adults. They and um, so like I really do wish that. I, so that for me, like having a modern Nancy Drew that's an adult character, you know, it's 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 great. And um, uh, yeah. So um, Guava, what about you? Um, what do you do? You overall enjoyed? Did you overall enjoy the book? And what is your opinion on it from zero to four stars? And then would you recommend it to someone? Yeah, so all in all, I think it's I think it's a uh it works as an introduction of like the characters that they're working with, like especially with Nancy, Bess, and George. Uh I think that works pretty well. Like it's a very it's a fun book to read through. Uh the mystery like is pretty cohesive aside from like the the parts that are left left uh and yeah i guess i guess if they wanted to make a big shake up to the nancy drew formula like it doesn't really feel like it almost feels like just like a a pretty average continuation of like nancy drew stories so i think yeah, so I guess in a way, like, it's a pretty good introduction to, like, younger people, but 
if you're looking for something really uh like that really like hooks you into like the nancy drew lore it might not be the best one to start with uh but overall yeah i give books, it a i'll two. tell you the yellow books nancy's completely out of pocket sometimes and i'm just like yo, yo. <laughs> okay <laughs> heard, yeah candy girl's back yes yeah i'm here yeah, okay so candy girl uh just quick so um to conclude um what is your overall opinion of the Nancy Drew um, Curse of the Arctic Star? Um, do you recommend the book to someone? And if you can just tell us on a score of zero to four stars um, what your star rating is. Uh, so yeah, I'll just reiterate. I'll just repeat again. Um, what is your star rating of the book from zero to four stars? And would you recommend the book to someone? So I actually have read many of the classic books um, as well as some of the case files and um, some other Nancy Drew books and uh, I just this this book was not um, not anywhere near some of the other books that I've read as far as uh, quality um, I'm I'm as if I I might recommend this book, but I'd probably recommend a lot of other books before this one. Um, I really enjoy like the the Big Lie series. Um, it's actually more of like a graphic novel version of Nancy Drew. I think those are really interesting. Mm. Um, and like I said, the classics like you can't you can't beat those. Um, and one thing that the classics had is illustrations and i think even if they did like just a couple throughout this book i think that might have been uh, a nice addition as well as the fact that this series is called nancy drew diaries and we get a diary entry at the very beginning of the book we get a diary entry at the very end of the book nothing for the whole the whole in in the whole of the book. I think it would have been great if there was like a diary entry for every chapter or every other chapter even. Um, just to bring the whole series title into it. Um, also the title of the book, Curse of the Arctic Star. Um, when I think of curse, I think of like supernatural. And to me, everything that happened in the story was just like pranks. It didn't really seem to have that like supernatural aspect so the the title even um when you read the book it's just underwhelming um and i just i just kept like i, w I was not impressed that's my overall uh that's i give it uh i give it a 1.75 Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, yeah that's a good point with the nate the titles of the books like it feels like it doesn't really match what actually happens <clears throat> what yeah. they should have done is a diary entry in, in the beginning of each chapter of the book mm. yeah that is a very interesting opinion and um, it, it, it definitely would uh, I think the problem there though is brevity and the books themselves are already really short so like if they do decide to go the route of um, of making a diary entry for each page um, actually I take that back I think a diary entry on each chapter would actually be a good idea because Nancy does a lot of internal reflection and if they were to like edit out some of that internal reflection and put it into the diary instead, that might actually be a better place to put it. That way, like we're seeing more internal reflection in the diary entries and more action in the actual segments. So instead of Nancy being in her head in certain chapters, she's actually like saving it for the diary um mm -hmm. what do you all yeah, think you about that yeah. also also the one with the with the diary entry in the beginning and the end reminds me of the games she's like dear <laughs> hannah blah, blah 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 and then she starts the mystery and then the end is like dear hannah blah 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 blah, blah. and i'm like yes this is, this is just the games i wonder yep. if carolyn keen like uh the modern carolyn keen i wonder if they played the games because it seems like i mean this is not even related to curse of the arctic star but in the fourth book, I believe, they go to Moon Lake, which is not the same Moon Lake as in Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake. But I wonder if there are some 
video game Easter eggs in the books. I'm a little I'm suspicious. Sure. I'm pretty sure they're like they made references to the game. Yeah. It exactly. is the most popular Nancy Drew video game. Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake? Oh, okay. Oh, no, no. Uh, the, the Her Interactive uh, um, Nancy Drew games. Oh. They are the most popular ones of them. There are others, but they are the most popular one. Okay. But, um, yeah, so I just want to... Um, so that pretty much summarizes all of our thoughts and all of our opinions on Nancy Drew, Curse of the Arctic, of the Arctic Star. Um, I do have one really quick, like, um, honorable mention that I wanted to talk about. Um, so I had this really wild idea. Um, so there was a detective book series that I used to read growing up and I, the name of it escapes me, but, um, what would happen is you would read a few chapters and it would give you a code and then you go to the website, type the code in and let you play a flash game of a segment like from that book and i don't like i said i don't remember the name of the book i'll have to go find it uh maybe if any of you listeners are out there that know it let me know but i don't even but basically what it was is that you would every few chapters you would uh do that same thing over and over again code flash game solve some puzzles do you think that the nancy drew games would benefit from something like that or the nancy drew books would would benefit from something like that where they have like some kind of online portion where you're um, playing a mini game or something. Absolutely. Any book would do so much better if there was an interactive aspect to it. Yeah. Uh. Well, I think for younger audiences, yeah. But I feel like for me, I just kind of want to read. If I'm reading a book, I just kind of want to read a book. Okay. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's <laughs> and that might be game. you, yeah. but I'm different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, it, it does depend on like the quality of the game too. Imagine like, it's like I a master that, Sudoku like... or something, like just some yeah. like, for example, crazy for example, puzzle. If, like you know, if Nancy did some actual slu- uh, sleuthing in this book, um, you know, like she'd be coming up and like to like this kind of like uh, code thing in the in the in the book itself. She'll like you know easily break the code, but then we can have access to the code and try to break it ourselves. Yeah, that, I mean, that would be, be fun. Part and they, of the mystery. They could also make it a game of its own. Like, they could make it a Steam game or something, and they'd be like, purchase the book today or something. But, like, um, yeah, and they could make it, like, a companion game that's, like, 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 imagine a situation where Nancy is, like, she comes across a puzzle, and it tells you to go open the game and go to that chapter, and then this is the puzzle you have to solve. And then if you don't have access to the game, all you all you have to do is just skip the page. Um, yeah. yeah, and then you know you Nancy solves the puzzle. I mean, it, so like you either find the clue from the game or you find the clue from the book, and the the book will tell you what the clue is regardless if you play the game or not. But if you just want a little extra something, I guess, um, I think that might be a really cool way to make more money off the Nancy Drew Diaries. Um, yeah, I was just curious to know your thoughts on all of that. Yeah, it it could work. Like maybe if it's something like. You have like the game series, and then there's a companion book series that maybe goes into like other like other side parts that you don't really get to see in the game. Like that that sounds interesting to me. I think in general, with that kind of stuff, I would probably just prefer to play a full game that has like the full story in it. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Or they could have done what they did in Sherlock. And you mm. know how like uh, uh, Wendy has a, like a blog. Like they can make that blog actually real, uh, and yes. then you can look yeah. at like the stuff that you know she posed. Yeah, that that would be cool. Okay, Just I see. Little Easter eggs, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that would be really cool if there was like each book kind had their own <laughs> Easter. <laughs> if each book had their own like little Easter egg, that would be cool too. Like their own little, little interactive thing. Um, but yeah, thank you for. Um, for, for listening to that honorable uh, mention really fast. Does anyone else have any honorable mentions uh, to, talk, to talk about as far as the Nancy Drew uh, diaries in general or Curse of the Arctic Star before we uh, before we end the show? Uh, no, I think that's it. All right, cool. Um, so I have one thing. <laughs> Guava's like, leave it to Guava. Objection. We hate, we hate Alan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, if you... If you could think of a better name than Curse of the 
Arctic Star for this book, where do you think it would be? That's a tough question. I'm tr yeah, because I'm trying to think of something that like fits better. It's like the cruise capers. <laughs> <laughs> The cruise oh. capers and also Alan. <laughs> well, the name of the cruise is called Superstar Cruise Liner, so I would you implement like I would use the word superstar somewhere in there, like uh, Super Trouble on Superstar Cruise or something like that. Oh my god! Yeah. See, it sounds a bit silly, but it fits the book much better. <laughs> I would like Crisis on the Cruise. Ooh, or, or, yeah, crisis or, cru crisis. or Cruise Crisis. Cruise yeah. Crisis. <laughs> With the you know the double the double cost the the alliteration. The Nancy yeah. Drew Prices. the Nancy Drew games do that too. Deadly Device, yeah. Labyrinth of mm. Lies, like they they've done that a few times. The sinking of Superstar. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh, yeah. If if they went that direction, that would have been amazing. Um, it's a good one. Uh, I, great yeah. question, Guava. Me, Did you Wonderful. have anything else? Oh, okay. Um, Alan sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so now that we're going to, we're going to transition to the ending. Um, I just want to say thank you, um, to Guava, Mitra, and the Candy Girl for all coming in tonight to, um, review Nancy Drew Diaries Curse of the Arctic, Arctic Star with me. Uh, this has been a fantastic episode of the Italian Gamer Joe podcast. It's been lovely getting the chance to talk to all of you. Um, Guava, can you please let us, let our listeners know, um, where they can find you? Oh, yes. I'm just Guava Jaguar uh, everywhere on social media. It's also on my website. Uh, just Guava, then J-A-G-U-L-A-R. And I do art, uh, some animations for Achievement Hunter. Uh, and I do a lot of, uh, like, emotes and stream drawings. Like, for instance, I'm doing the art for Super Spy Academy, a game that Italian Gamer Joe is working on. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate that little um, shout out as well. Wink. Out the game. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Guava. Um, Mira, what about you? Uh, where can our listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitch under the name meet underscore RA. Um, I stream. Right now I'm streaming Nancy Drew Marathon, uh, but I play whatever game interests me at the time so after i finish nancy drew it's going to be the quarry so Ooh, nice very fun game also um you know i make everything super gay <laughs> it's it's always a great time on your twitch channel and uh thank you thank you um and the candy girl um thank you again for coming as well um where can our listeners follow your content or follow you I have no content currently. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, uh, I like to hang out with Italian Gamer Joe and Mitra <laughs> on Twitch and in their Discord channels. Absolutely. And um, yeah, so in the Kenny Girl, you are a fantastic um, community member, community moderator. Um, and we know that you're a huge Nancy Drew super fan as well. So it's it's been an honor having you here tonight on the, on the podcast because... Um, uh, all the deep lore of nancy drew yeah the candy girl the candy girl <laughs> your yeah your knowledge of the nancy drew universe is fantastic so we really appreciated you having here having you on the show tonight um so thank you um and yeah once again i just want to say a big wide thank you to all of you for coming tonight to review uh nancy drew curse of the arctic star this is going to be one of many podcast uh, reviews for the Nancy Drew Diaries books. So for those of you listeners that are here tonight, um, if you enjoyed this episode of the Italian Gamer Joe podcast, please consider subscribing uh, to the channel and also checking my content out on Twitch at Italian Gamer Joe. I, um, I play the Nancy Drew games pretty frequently. Um, I just finished all 33 games on Twitch in the uh, Amateur Sleuth Detective, and now I'm going back and replaying them on the Senior Detective difficulty. I also play many, many other adventure games as well. Uh, so feel free to check out Italian Gamer Joe on Twitch if you would like to see some more Nancy Drew-related content, and also stay tuned for additional Nancy Drew reviews as well, both the books and the games 
Uh, tonight we reviewed one of the Nancy Drew books, but on the horizon, I will also be doing a Nancy Drew review of uh, the 32nd mystery, which is Nancy Drew Sea of Darkness. Uh, that is another review coming down the line soon. Um, but once again, I just want to say thank you for listening and um, hope you all have a wonderful evening um, or afternoon or morning, wherever you are, whenever you are, however you happen to be listening. Um, but good night, everybody. Good night, Guava. Meet Red, the Candy Girl. Thank you all so much again for coming in. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Have a good night. And we will go ahead and just uh, end the show. Thanks, everyone, for coming and see you all next time. Mm-hmm.